Marina, you ready to rock and roll? That's your best. All right. Let's call the meeting to order at 610. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I have no amendments to the agenda. Does anybody have anything to add from the board? Community engagement and public um, comments. Uh, does anybody have anything to say this evening? If so, please introduce yourselves. Um, give us your name, where you're from, so Raina can take uh, the minutes. Um, here we go. Yes, hi. Hi. Do you understand? Yes, please. My name is Max Ely. I was here a couple board meetings ago. Um, Three children grew up here, two alum from this school. About 20 years ago when we were already hearing that the school needed to be livened up a little bit. I wanted to um, let you all know that about three Thursdays ago, the Vermont Community Foundation held this annual meeting at Billings Farm. There were 475 people in attendance, state leaders, a lot of community members. I'm chairing the foundation this year my, in my opening remarks. I referenced that we have the best educators in the state, and um, I sincerely meant that, but I also did reference the fact that our school was undergoing a study and looking at what we needed to do to bring our school up to snuff. And afterwards, I think there must have been at least, at least three or four, possibly more, people that approached me and said, how are you doing that? And I said, I don't know yet, it's in the early stages, but um, a lot of kudos to Woodstock and to this board for, for being so forward thinking. So I just wanted to share that those conversations had taken place, but the bigger comments were made in front of the whole audience. So just, I don't think anybody here was there, but I so, anyway, thought you should know. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Yep. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Michael Zoldis, and I, I know many of you here. Um, I was the middle and high school band director here from 2002 to 2006, I'm uh, sorry, 2008. And I'm here to um, offer my full support for building the new facility. Um, the current band room, uh, as, as you all know, is situated below the middle school gym. And the sound of feet and bouncing balls presented a challenging learning environment, particularly when teaching softer pieces of music. Having to teach in a loud environment habituates both the teacher and the students to that subpar environment, making it something that I and my students would need to ignore and endure. We had only two usable practice rooms, which were packed with the choral and band libraries and a third instrument storage room. I could use two of the rooms to allow students to practice, but not while I had other, other uh, teaching going on because they weren't soundproof. While I was teaching here, I had four different choral colleagues during, during the time that I was teaching here, whose jobs were made all the more challenging by having to teach in a large windowless supply closet across from the band room. It's no secret that these chorus teachers all struggled with recruitment, and it's no wonder since they too had to make do. That is the message we're sending to Jody Henderson and his students if we choose the status quo. Just make do, make do for now. Whenever I had the opportunity to visit other public schools throughout Vermont uh, for, for the Allstate Music Festival or for district festivals, one of the things that I noticed about the host schools is that they had the administrative support to host the festival and the <coughs> physical capacity, the physical capacity. They had the rooms, they had the band room, they had the choral room. They had the physical capacity to host. Most of these schools, South Burlington, Middlebury, Harwood High School, Brattleboro, they have large band rooms with high ceilings acoustical tile, natural light, and soundproof practice rooms. Having soundproof practice rooms allows these band directors to have students come in during free periods and work on music, not just for their programs, but if we're looking to promote excellence 
for the District Music Festival, for the All State, All New England, All Eastern Music Festivals. Without them, the students can't practice during their day, and so they will frequently practice less. Having good, solid, soundproof practice rooms allows these band directors to hi also hire local professional wind and brass players to teach pull-out private lessons during the school day if their schedules don't, teaching schedules don't allow for lessons. Hanover High School has this program in place. As a result, the musical achievement of the students from these schools is higher in side-by-side -side comparison to a school like Woodstock where the students can't practice during their school days. At a time when the Woodstock Economic Development Committee and Sustainable Woodstock are looking for citizen input on how to improve our town, I think that it is imperative that this board act without further delay to green light this facility. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, hi, um, I'm Matt Stout, a 12 year resident of Woodstock. Um, I've got children in the first and seventh grade. Um, I think I want to start. I'm, I'm also here to support the new, uh, the new building if, if one is, um, is, is undertaken. Um, but I want to start by commending and thanking this board. Uh, my wife served on the board for five years, uh, two years when it was consolidated, and three is the uh, chair of the elementary and on your page uh, as a board member at large. Um, so I want to thank you for your stewardship over the years. Um, I've followed the board's activities. Um, I think what you've done during challenging circumstances, Act, two, Act 46 primarily, uh, to unify our curriculum, uh, to unify our, our governance under a, a, a larger board, uh, to deal with uh, very challenging budgeting constraints, uh, to create equity for students and teachers, um, the portrait of a graduate, uh, difficult uh, issues around campus configuration. I think you guys have done a, a terrific job. Um, I, you know, at times the decisions are con controversial. I think you've really landed in every case that I've watched on the right side of the, of the issues. Um, but it's also been hard because, you know, oftentimes the decisions are cuts or positions that might be lost or uh, grades that might move from one uh, town to another. Um, so it does feel at this point in time that um, we're, we're getting to a point where maybe some of that's behind us and that we have an opportunity to, to focus on an aspirational goal like, like a new middle school and high school uh, building. And um, I think there's momentum to target this uh, exciting project. I think there's clearly a need. Um, I think the, the, the phase two of the master plan facilities report shows that. Um, I, I personally have 20 years in the field of, of energy efficiency, renewability, sustainability. I, the large, I design large uh, solar power plants, wind power plants that replace coal facilities that are on average anywhere from two to $300 million investments. So I deal with big projects like these. Um, I think clearly the report states you'll never achieve the goals of energy efficiency with the current design and envelope. Um, I do think net zero is achievable but not with this building. I think it's an aspirational goal uh, to really practice what we preach to our children. This is a place where um, with a, a newer building, you could educate our children on what uh, sustainability looks like. Um, and then just as a parent, I, I do see the benefits of things like improved air quality, school safety, um, a 21st century learning environment that's got to, you know, classrooms built for what uh, for the function and their purpose uh, and then finally and I'm going to conclude uh, I think it benefits the children uh, currently but I, if you look to the future we all want to see uh, a return of growth and not talk about declining school population but about growing school populations um, in my career I'm involved with economic development but even locally I've done a little bit with um, trail construction recreational trails and have uh, applied for EDC grants and recently reported out on that. And 
you know, all of us moved to this community for something. It, maybe it was the ski trails or the mountain bike trails or uh, the hiking trails or uh, you know, some element of what we love about Vermont. And then there was always the school system. It's a great school system and you feel like you can bring your family here because it's a good school system. And I think that we have to continue to strive for that and you know, nothing would say that more than uh, not just all the programs you're currently putting into place, but a, a new building. I think it would attract more people to the area. So with that, I will conclude. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Hi, I'm Hello, Carrie Mary. Cole. I live in Woodstock. Um, I'm married to a board member. Um, I uh, sell real estate. And I kind of feel like I'm a little matchmaker for people and homes. And the thing that people are looking for all the time when they come up here is the quality of life. And I'm very happy to tout that we have such a wonderful, um, uh, you know, we have a wonderful school system. We have amazing teachers. We have amazing programs. Come look at the elementary school playground. Isn't it beautiful? But maybe don't look at the middle school and high school quite yet. <laughs> Um, and so I so appreciate all the work that the board has been doing, but you know it's a it's a huge piece of quality of life to have facilities that reflect the quality of the education that we already are giving our students. Um, because when people are comparing Woodstock, they're comparing them comparing Woodstock to places like Hanover, and it's it's tough. It's it's tough for them to to believe if they are just looking at our facilities. Um, so I really appreciate the work that the board has done, and I would really encourage you to quickly move it along. Um, time is really of the essence, and I think the, the time is the time is now. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, I'm gonna move along. Uh, board committee and chair reports. Uh, Mary Beth, would you like to start? Do you, want, um, do you want to do any committees from the board? Or, or do we do the superintendent's report? Superintendent's report. Okay, there you go. Um, so you have the, your packet, the superintendent's report, um, October 1 enrollment. This is the enrollment figure we typically report to the state. Um, one of the things that we're finding as we are working on foundation systems, working on our student information system, that we are cleaning up a lot of our data. So these numbers are, are moving somewhat. Um, but we are currently at 1,024, we were at 1,028 last year. Um, what, what we will have for you in the next board report is actually a breakdown where all of our students come from across all the towns and by grade levels. Um, that's, a, that's a piece of information the board has asked me for and we should have those, that data ready for you by the November board. Um, one of the things that is um, highlighted in this report is a re recent in-service day. Last Monday, we had an in-service day for all of our teachers, and we brought in Dave Melnick, who is an expert on trauma-informed practice. And if I could, Sherry, would you like to just speak briefly about Dave's work in the district and where we're headed with that? All right, we've worked with Dave Melnick and NFI for the last 20 years. They really are the New England experts in trauma. They bring speakers from all over the country to present in the area. The last conference they did in April, there were a thousand people who attended and had to be at the expo up in Champlain Valley. So this is like the highest caliber of individual. Um, out of Quichi Health Foundation brought the resources to us last spring asking us if we would dedicate some of our time as a faculty and um, leadership team with working with Dave Melnick and his team. Um, we um, use them to evaluate students who've experienced developmental trauma, find their work and expertise to really add to um, the strengthening the work that we're currently doing. We spent a whole day really focusing on the kinds of students, the student population everyone has in any group of students. 20% will have experienced some kind of um, developmental trauma that will significantly impact their ability to learn and, and form relationships talked about how it is for teachers, the experiences they have, and how different that is when, from when a student is presenting behavioral issues. And really gave principals as well as classroom teachers the ability to kind of tease out, is the, what I'm seeing today the result of a trauma or really a, a behavioral issue? And gave the faculty some really strong um, techniques and strategies um, to working with students. Uh, he will be working with our district for the next three to five years. Um, we ha he's be offering a course starting in January 
Um, we have 28 teachers. We were only supposed to have 20 sign up for the class, so we're all asking for special uh, compensation so we can have more teachers. We will have enough to offer the class again next year um, so that we will all be getting graduate work in developmental trauma. He will also be, NFI will be giving us some evaluations. An evaluation from NFI is about three to $4,000 per student. And so out of Peachy Health Foundation's grant will allow us to do three to five a year um, covered by OHF, um, as well as working with leadership team and developing our skills and working with um, students of trauma and faculty members with trauma. So it really is a broad a group. Um, it's very exciting. He really is the expert. And he will also be consulting with school teams on individual students who have had those experiences what the, and how we work and develop programming for them. And so it really allows us to meet students' needs within our own buildings. Um, one of the ways that we really saved our special education costs is by developing our capacity so we don't have to send kids, you know, when you've experienced trauma, you've, you've formed relationships with your teachers and then you can't function in your building and then we send you to another school and it forces that trauma. And so we've really done a great job in having our classroom teachers really embrace these students, develop programs and sensitivity around their needs. And so it's, it's pretty exciting to have. And we, I did a survey post um, the uh, post the training and 95% um, of the faculty felt that it was impactful for the next day of the class and that they really loved the strategies and they would love to do another district-wide training. So we're talking to um, Teo from Adequichi Health Foundation about another possible training for next fall, again, around some of the our global equity issues, um, equity issues around, and our district are really around socioeconomic issues. So whether the trauma piece and other issues that we are facing, every teacher, every administrator, you know, what kinds of training can we benefit from? So we're really appreciating that partnership with Taylor and her team. Um, and you know, one of the things that I, I'm mindful of this evening as we're talking about different issues is the, the new build issue is related to the learning environments in our strategic plan. Um, if you'll remember, we were talking about um, looking at strategies for building proactive K-12 health programs, so you're seeing evidence of that. And the other thing that's in your book this evening is related to instructional technology and talking about our second um, administration of the STAR assessment that gives us data on all students. Um, to let us know where we want to go instructionally. So today we had our, our coaches and we had our third grade teachers and our fourth grade teachers looking at data and leaving that meeting was something that they could act on uh, immediately upon returning to their classroom based on the data. What are the, just the specific um, supports and strategies my students need? So the STAR data that you see referenced here is one of the, the critical tools that allows us to do that, and that was put into place last year. Um, the other thing that is um, is kind of a back of the house function, but the state is um, continues to ask for large amounts of data to be uploaded um, to their their data banks. And again, with our new student information system, what we find, we are working so that that data transfer for is much smoother than it's been in the past. There have been periods of time where RAP has been offline for uh, several months just trying to get the data cleaned up and up to the state. So what I can tell you is that we're making really good progress on that. I want, really want to compliment um, RAP and its team um, for the work that they're doing. Um, it's one of those things that it's not particularly flashy, you don't read a lot about, but when it's not done well, it can really slow a system down. Um, and then the final note here is that um, I think we, we formally welcomed Mike um, at our last meeting, who was working diligently in the back there, and will be talking with us later. Um, but we I shared in the book that our uh, staff accountant um, has also given notice. So we, we are a little stretched in our finance department right now. Um, the team is pulling together um, and working to work through the transition. Um, but um, that is something that I think, you know, the board should be aware of that our finance and operations department is pretty strapped at the moment. Thank you. Any questions for Mary Beth? All right. Um, I just have some quick house cleaning things. Um, I'll piggyback off of Mary Beth saying that the finance department is pretty strapped. Um, and because of that, we have to be very cognizant of how we request information from the finance department. So Mary Beth has made the request that all 
um, finance uh, requests uh, go through Jennifer as chair of the finance committee so that she can kind of oversee what's being requested so that maybe some questions from people aren't being repeated over and over and that other information come through me from the chairs of the committees uh, as well to go to either Mary Beth or to go to finance. Um, but we're finding that they're inundated with questions from various peoples on the board and that it's getting sometimes lost in translation or it's inundating the departments and they're not able to really focus on what needs to be done on a day-to-day -day basis. So we're trying to just streamline it a little bit more. So when you come out of your committee meetings, the chair should just write down the questions that they'd like to have, you know, answer, give us a, a, a timetable of when you need those answers by and we will send them off to the appropriate people as well as Mary Beth then sending them off to the appropriate people within the SU. It just will kind of streamline things and, and keep us all straight since they're feeling a little stressed in the SU office right now. Um, another uh, thing that Jennifer and I have worked on um, is that we will be um, sending out a new committee subcommittee list this week um, and I, I just wanted you to know that we've been really thinking hard about this and I think it's important for all of us to sit on some of these subcommittees and refocus ourselves so that uh, we can move forward with our projects at hand. Um, I think it's really important that we get our communication out to um, the public um, so that the, it becomes a stronger voice for the for the board overall um, we've got to look at at buildings and grounds as well as uh, the new build too so these are some of the things that are on our um, radar right now I and believe anybody who's reached out to us to ask to be on a committee we, we honored that and then for those of you who didn't we assigned you to one. So. Yeah. And if you don't like the committee that you you're on, we can change them. That That's not a big deal. So just kind of a, a heads up there. Also, um, we kind of want to give you a heads up that Jennifer and I will be stepping down as chairs in March. We have one, one more year. Um, until March, we have we, we have one a, more year cheer, after March. Right, after March, we have one more year on the board. Um, but we want you all to start kind of really thinking about who did you who would you like to see leave this board in the future. Um, my only recommendation to you all is that your two leaders come from two towns. I think that's really important so that you. <coughs> Um, offset each other um, and and just start putting your thinking caps on I think it's really important to look at each other um, to build a team to keep that team build going as you move forward because you've got some really big projects on your plate that you want to move forward quickly and you've got to be able to have some team leaders that can do that as well um, and, and be good leaders overall um, and our hopes is that it will just um, you know. well, we want to do this now so that we're we're still on the board for a year so that it gives you know us some time to to mentor people and, and help um, you know certainly I can help with finance Paige can help with negotiations and really you know getting the new chairs um, comfortable in their positions as opposed to just staying on a year and a half and then both getting off the board and have all new chairs. So I think it makes sense to have us still here and able to, to help with that year-long transition. Um, press, uh, one of the things that has come up is there's been a lot of press. Who answers questions? Who doesn't answer questions? Um, traditionally, it's usually been the superintendent um, from the school systems and the chairs from the board. Uh, that's how we've done it historically. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, 
I think that it's important to have consistency though. I think we have to learn. It's very hard sometimes to um, be consistent with the board's view versus being maybe putting a personal view in it when you don't have um, answers to everything that you'd like to have answers to. Um, but I think that's how Mary Beth would like to continue that kind of answering. Well, you know, what, what, uh, what we can speak to or what I can speak to is the staff. So I usually have everything come to me and then sometimes it's appropriate for it to go back up to summer. Or, but typically, and this is something that's come up in a number of different issues as of late, is that um, different media outlets are providing incorrect information. And when that gets out, that's really difficult for the community. So an example recently was that um, the recommendation that I shared with you last week, the headline was um, moving the superintendent's office to Prosper Valley, right? Okay. And um, so one of the things that I think is really important is that we are providing as accurate as possible information to our, um, our townspeople. So from the from the, the school side, I, I'm answering those with the latest information. I often send the documents that we, that are generated at the board meeting. As you said, the board has to decide how they want to handle that. If they want to have everything go through the chair, or if you want to have a different piece to that. Okay. Yep. Um, I certainly understand that it's. Um, challenging and difficult when when you see something that's reported incorrectly and then you deal with the fallout of that but at the same time I really worry and I especially worried a couple of weeks ago when this all transpired in, in a couple of statewide outlets mm -hmm. that um, like sort of big bolded words that the superintendent says you know no comment and we're too busy educating to talk about this that that also spreads around as a kind of strange, well, why won't they talk? And then that becomes the subject. Yeah, so no, I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up, because I think it's really helpful to clarify that. So the, the, the sentence that was put up was one of a uh, several sentence statement that they had asked me for. Um, and they kind of picked and choose what was there. Okay. Um, but what in that particular instance, what had happened was I was in a meeting. Somehow the reporter got my direct line and continually called during the meeting. So I finally picked up the phone, and he wanted an interview right then and there. And I explained that that's not possible while I was booked for the rest of the day. Um, and so one of the things that happens oftentimes with media outlets is they have a deadline. I'm calling you at noontime. I need to get something to my editor by 3 o'clock. And you know I want a couple sign bites from you, and then move on. And so, And that's where I think the misinformation gets out. Right, and so I, what I often do is I will send the documents. So here are the facts. You know, tell me what the questions are. I invited the gentleman to um, email me. I was going to be in another meeting, but I would give my best effort to return his email, which I did, um, with documents that were improperly referenced, um, along with a statement. But, was, but yeah, I mean, so that sort of goes to my point that yeah. even when you were trying to. Right, so, that, so the way still, that that works then yeah. is, you know, in one situation I contacted a media outlet and asked for a correction where the information was, was inaccurate. And then I, what I do is I speak to the editor and I say, here's the situation, right? It's really critical that our town's folks and our voters get good, accurate information. When I'm called and I am unable to answer a phone call because I am sitting with somebody that's scheduled an appointment, and, and it gets pushed to, well, like, you tell me right now, I can see. That's not fair. Right? I, I agree. I just, I yeah. guess my, my conclusion from, from it mm -hmm. is that I guess as a board member, I would advocate that we um, put transparency ahead of our concerns that sometimes there will be mistakes, and there will be, mm -hmm. and then we can correct them. But I think that um, being truly transparent and also gaining trust of people because they know and feel that we are transparent mm -hmm. will go a long way. Yeah, no, and I would absolutely agree with you, Pam. That's really important to get the information out. But there, you know, there, I, you know, I can't pull principles out for a reporter that wants to know, you know, I need to speak to somebody right now, which happens a lot, 
right? So there is also the, here are the guidelines. We want to give you accurate information. You know, I spoke with a reporter today that called me at, contacted me at noontime and wanted an appointment immediately, right? But I, I squeezed it in in about five minutes, right? But I, I do need you to understand how this typically works. Right? Oh, I just need five minutes. So I said, why don't you tell me what you understand about the information factually, and we can, I can be sure that everything that you have is factually correct, right? and then I can answer any clarifying questions you have. Well, I really haven't looked into this much. Right? So I, I, have, you know, I feel a responsibility for the district to make sure that there's some level of management of that, um, and, and to, to absolutely be transparent and to offer all the information that we have but that, that we are not often able to just stop and um, take some, what are sometimes very aggressive calls that expect you to speak immediately. And I, I do not think it's in the district's best interest to do that. Uh -huh. I'll just agree with Mary Beth. I've had, especially during Act 46, and I've had people call my house at bedtime, dinner time, come to the store and find me because they know that that's where I work. So it's hard when you're cut off guard that way and you're trying to find the right words and say the right things, and so it's not always the right time. So I, I agree. I, you know, I understand where you're coming from, Mary Beth, and you're saying, you know, you're the superintendent, and you do get to everybody that works in the school. They, they work underneath you. Um, this is a board. Each individual board member has its right to do whatever. Nobody on this board here can tell me to speak or not to speak. It's, it's me. Um, just so you folks know, like I got an email on something the other day saying, hey, blah, 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 and I wrote back, well, first off, what is your concern so I'm ready? I mean, that's one thing I do. I'm not telling you how to do it, but that's what I do. What's your concern? Um, you know, it's a newspaper. It's, it's, they're, they're reporters. They're going to take two or three words from this paragraph, and they're going to take two or three <coughs> words from that paragraph, and they're going to make a sentence out of it. And you just have to watch what you're saying or whatever and be prepared. But if we're going to sit here, I understand completely what you're saying to your staff and principals. Is you're their boss, but, you know, we're your boss. We're not their bosses. And uh, we're, we're, we're voted in by our individual towns. And if you want to talk to the press, I'm not going to hold you against it if you say something. Because I also understand that this is a board. And each individual person on this board is only one of 18. That's it. And that's what the press has to understand, that when they're doing it, they're quoting what you're saying. You know, I could be 110% for the school, a new school. Somebody else here could be 10% for the school. Does that mean you can't answer the question? I don't know. It's up to you. It's not up to Mary Bath, and it's not up to us to tell another board member to speak to the press or not to. I'll just tell you to be careful. It's the press. You got one here, got one back here, he knows it. You know, sometimes they're gonna get, they're gonna get it wrong. No. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. A-F-F. Oh, he is. <laughs> He's great, he emails me questions. He's prepared, you know? So, and you don't have to answer all the time. Okay, we ready to move on? Mm -hmm. um, I would like to, um, we haven't picked out our date for our retreat yet. We're still trying to figure that out because I want the most people there as possible. But please take these home. Thank you, Claire, for, her, for providing this. And thank you, I would assume, Jason, for providing this. Mary Beth. Mary Beth, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, please read this so that you're informed when you come to the retreat so that we can have a really good, intelligent conversation um, about the new build project. Um, what? When is the retreat? Yeah, can I, can I just, just said first? I didn't know the date oh, yet. Uh, can we take it? I feel like I missed something between our last board meeting and then this email saying we're having a retreat. We, we didn't miss anything. We just... We've decided that that what we need is we need to have a retreat in order to discuss this new building um, because it's really important that we move forward with how we're going to move forward with this project and the whole board needs to discuss it. 
because there's just small entities who have been discussing it to date. And if we are going to back this project as a whole, then we need to gather together to discuss it at length. And I think, I think that it would be really wonderful to come out of um, our next meeting. Uh, Jennifer and I have talked to some people who have been leading some of these conversations and they brought some valuable um, information to us about um, coming up with mission statements, supporting Portrait of the Graduate, our five-year strategic plan, how, how we're going to move forward um, supporting those goals that we have already voted on and support it, um, looking at why we support a new build, um, the reasons why we think it's important for us to support that, um, looking at um, the pros of a new building, um, what those can be to our community, to our children, to the educational outcomes, as well as looking at the financials and really diving a little bit deep, deeper into the, into the financials. Yes, Jim. So I spent a Saturday morning and part of a Saturday afternoon, I don't know, four months ago, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and in that Saturday meeting, one of the discussions was about the committee for the new build or whatever, <laughs> configuration, which included the building or whatever. We voted completely to back the idea of going further with the finance and everything. And they're going to be reporting that tonight. Okay. So yeah. what I'm tonight getting at is, is that yes. we, we've been waiting for that information. You know, I, I love the idea that everybody in the audience thinks the whole board has done work. I want to give the congratulations to the committee that has been doing work on this. But I mean, um, we had a meeting, was it June? June 6th. June 6th. And then I went to a meeting over in um, Pomfret. <laughs> and that a town hall at Pomfret, that's what threw me off. But the question was asked repeatedly from the audience, when did this group met? And the, the answer was the last time was in April. So has this group met again? So they're going to... They're on the tonight to give an update. Been I know, but so do they have... They had a meeting last week, I think. They had, you had a meeting last week. And so that's they're, they're, gonna, yeah. okay. they're going so, to be presenting okay. tonight. So they're going to present tonight, mm -hmm. and then we're going to have a yeah. another Saturday. Sometime next week. Sometime we're going to have some Correct. just on this discussion. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Just to, fra just, you know, just so to frame it a little bit, the, the committee um, that Bob and I co-chair is there's multiple charges so the <clears throat> the middle high school build is one of those three four primary charges um, so being able to divide it out and spend more attention to the individual topics just seems to be able to make more sense as you said you're in Pomfret you know a couple weeks ago and obviously the conversation there was about the Foster Valley School so we didn't touch on this so um, there's just lots of different things to, to unpack and it's probably more fair to be able to give the appropriate attention to each each one to be able to focus on it. Okay, so they had a meeting last week. And yeah, so with that, I am going to hand it off to Bryce and Ben <laughs> to report back to you on what we had charged right. them with. Okay. Okay. Do, you want, do you want to do that now, Mary Great. Can I, can I use the projector? All right. <laughs> Well, Ben gets ready. I can just do an update on the finance committee. Yeah. Um, <coughs> we met Three weeks. Um, so we're starting with the budget. Um, we invite any and all interested parties to come next Wednesday morning. Um, 8 o'clock. So Wednesday morning at 8. Yes, sure. Um, and 8.30, I guess. Email? Yeah. Um, we're meeting it uh, in Mike's office. Or, in the, in the office of the central office. Um, and we're just going to continue going with the, with the budget. And I guess that'll 
little more context, what Ben is setting up. We, uh, so later on in the agenda, there's conversation about a recommendation towards TVPS in particular, so I won't talk about that now. Um, but particularly, there's a, a finance working group that has been working with Mike, Richard, before he left, um, some people from the state trying to uh, kind of grapple hold of the financial um, impact that a new build might possibly have, and that's what we'll go over now. For Ben, we'll go. The family von Trapp. This in particular, I mean, you have a timeline on there. Yeah, yeah. more appropriate just to. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. That's one. Okay. Great. Take this book out here. Anything? Is that the last one? Was, it was necessary. Oh. Was so. Okay. All right. Hey, everybody. Um, here to give the update from the Financial Strategies Working Group. We named it. It's got a subcommittee of the Working Group of the uh, Configuration Committee. Um, and just as uh, Mary Beth indicated, really we're here to talk about you know the, the, the cost of the new middle school and high school bill, right? So um, who's on? Uh, who are the contributors to the group? Um, this is a strange configuration, but um, yeah, in, uh, folks have asked like, who, has this group met? Who's on it? You can see the folks on the slide. You know, Bob and Bryce, um, myself, Jason, uh, our finance folks, uh, Mike and Richard before we left. Mary Beth was uh, helpful uh, this summer in pulling some folks in, and then. Lots of other folks got together uh, in uh, September to kind of kick some things off and um, you know talk about some some kind of high level strategies. Um, I'm probably forgetting some folks, but uh, thanks to everybody who was part of that. So what I'd like to go over tonight, and this will you know probably take about 20 minutes if that's okay, is um, you know kind of recapping the events. We'll have a schedule in there, um, and then it's really all about questions, right? Like you know how much does the, the is the new building going to cost? How are we going to raise the money? Some of those questions we've been able to answer, some of them uh, are still open. We're gonna be clear about what we know and what we don't know. Um, so here's a recap. Um, this, uh, on the, at least the middle school and high school build aspect of it really uh, started with uh, you know, a, a couple years ago, 2017, kicking off the 21st century school master plan. Matt, I think you mentioned that in your comments. Um, then for a, a couple of years, there were a couple of significant activities, the baseline facility study and some visioning workshops and then uh, we brought in Lee Sherwood uh, from the architectural firm, you know, uh, in uh, 2019 to you know, present some options, and we were able to, you know, as a committee, uh, but the configuration committee and then the full board uh, endorsed those and, um, you know, kind of tasked the, the committee with uh, looking at financial feasibility. And then uh, really the summer after the June meeting was when we kind of formed the group and did a lot of outreach. So to kind of dig into that, the, for those in attendance, the, the full board took a tour of the middle school, high school building today. And so these are some of the issues that we got a chance to witness firsthand tonight. Um, just to recap some of them, but just to be clear, I want to I say that the current facility is compliant, right? There is nothing um, good that's currently illegal about what's been going on with this facility. Um, but in many cases, some of these issues that you see, it's a matter of the, the building was built before these codes existed, right? Things like uh, you know snow load and uh, drift requirements, um, and so you know the building's grandfathered, right? And will continue to be grandfathered in, until they change those approaches. Or you know I, I think there's potentially a trigger if you do 
you know, a massive, um, you know, um, you know, improvement to a building that you've got to bring things up to code. I don't know where that, that line is. Um, anyway, you can see some of the issues, um, structural security, indoor air quality, energy efficiency. This is the, a, um, a function of the baseline facility study that was done in, I believe, 2017. Um, from there, there was an educational visioning workshop. This is one thing that our district has been very proactive about. Uh, this consisted of 25 teachers, administrators, students, parents, um, you know, people working with um, a design firm and our architects, and you know, they confirmed a lot of the same things that you, you saw you know, on, the pri on the prior slide. Um, ch uh, challenges both inside and outside the classroom. So, um, as a result of that, uh, what uh, the, uh, the kind of the goal statement that we came up with, and I'm going to go ahead and read this, is what we want for a new facility is a safe, open, daylit, flexible, and collaborative learning environment, <coughs> welcoming to the whole community with proper adjacency, student display, healthy energy efficient systems, integrated technology, high performance construction, and connected to the site and natural resources. Sounds wonderful. <laughs> um, we hired an architect, and uh, they gave us some some options. This is a, a drawing of the option that the board picked. Pretty inspiring. Mm -hmm. um, here are the options themselves. The scoring that you see on the slide, this is just a recap from what we did in May and June. Um, you can see those that mission statement, that goal statement that I read, kind of translated to scoring. And uh, each of these categories were scored. Uh, the three options that were presented by the architect were you know, renovate the existing facility, um, you know, keep the existing facility, but then have a whole bunch of add-ons to it in addition to renovation, or just build a, a new facility. And that's what you see on the option two. And from a scoring standpoint, that new facility um, was the clear, you know, leader on all the uh, things that we, we uh, indicated were goals. Uh, then from a cost standpoint, uh, you know, it becomes even more clear just, you know, uh, throwing money at the existing facility, you're going to spend, you know, 50 million bucks and, you know, not meet, um, you know, the project goals. Uh, you build this kind of monstrosity on top of what we've got um, here already, and it's, you know, a huge facility that costs a ton of money. And then there's kind of the you know baby bear option, <laughs> just right, which is the, the new the new uh, the new school coming in between 58 and uh, you know 66.5 million. Um, and I want to just uh, focus everybody in on the, the construction costs because I'm going to present some information from some comparisons that we've done recently. That 38 million is a key figure. I want everybody to kind of keep their eye on. Okay, uh, moving right along. So from from there, so the board uh, the configuration committee looked at those recommendations. Picked the uh, the river school option as we're calling it, and uh, came back and said, well, while we're doing a new construction at the middle school and high school, we also have some issues that we need to address at the elementary uh, schools across the district. So let's let's do that too. Uh, Five million dollars added on there, and that's where we get this 68 million dollar figure. Uh, from there, um, the board uh, came together, endorsed that recommendation. Jim, just as you were saying, uh, and the said, committee. Uh, no, the, 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 the committee's recommendation, the configuration committee, right. and then the board in June said, yeah, configuration committee, go figure out if we can afford it. Okay, that's, that's I thought you meant the board approved the prior thing. We had no information about all No, 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 no. We're, this is where we are in the, in the process. Right. Okay. Uh, although it did make it into the strategic plan, maybe a little bit more of a leading in fashion, right? Fully implement and fund the board approved recommendations of the configuration committee. Not really. I mean, we got we got to prove this stuff, but um, it's it's there. I think, and it's you know, top of mind for everybody. Uh, can I just? I'm sorry. Yeah. Can we go back one slide. Sure. I, I think the language is really important because it. I mean, I guess I'd have to look at the minutes, but mm -hmm. my understanding of the the uh, June if it was June meeting yeah. was that we the full board approved the financial feasibility report, but did not approve what the way that's. There was no recommendation. It, it seems like it's phrased in a way that that sounds like. The full board approved moving forward with the build. No, than no, that's not what I'm trying to say. Okay, good. The, the board, just want to be sure. We yeah. just want to make sure the press gets that right. Yeah, this is a, this is a, <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, this is a quote from from our from our meetings from June. You can go look them up, but it's to pursue evaluating the financial Perfect. feasibility, and that's Thank what you. I'm here to talk about. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, so there's a strategic plan. Okay, so I, I talked at the start that uh, I was going to talk about, uh, and thanks for indulging kind of the rewind there in the level setting. I know there's a lot of new folks who. Or myself included, I learned a lot kind of you know, participating in this. So what questions uh, are we raised that we're going to uh, answer tonight, or uh, try to answer? Um, how do we pay for a new bill? That comes down to what sources of funding. Um, there's an issue with the Vermont um, education finance system um, that raises an issue of, of double counting. And I'll get into that when we get to it. Some folks are familiar with it, some less so. Um, and, and would that apply? 
Uh, for amounts raised by uh, bond funding, how would, uh, how would a bond work with seven different towns across our school district? And then if the bond passes, how much will education taxes go up? I think that's the big question that everybody wants to know. And at the end of the presentation, I'll have preliminary figures. I've been working with Mike and uh, Richard and others to you know, present some of that information. Um, highly um, kind of um, tentative, we'll say. So uh, how do we figure this stuff out? Well, we talk to people. We talk to people who've, who've you know, done this stuff recently, uh, reached out to folks kind of across the state. Uh, the first meeting uh, Mary Beth um, set up was with Brad James, the Director of Education Finance, met with Brad in August. Really, it was enlightening, dispelled a lot of kind of misconceptions that we had about the way it would work. Um, Paul Giuliani is an attorney in Vermont. He's, uh, I think you could, you could call him the preeminent bond counsel for the state of Vermont. He's recently uh, handled um, you know, bonds that have passed in both Winooski and Burlington. And uh, so we got in touch with him. Richard specifically worked with him four years ago on a, uh, some, a bond that had gotten passed for the uh, middle, middle school and high school. And um, uh, you know, uh, got in touch and answered some questions. Kind of more things got answered. Um, well, we, speaking of Winooski and Burlington, uh, we reached out to them as well. Mike DeCaro is the school board chair. I talked to him as well as Keith Pillsbury, the Finance Committee Chair for Burlington. Both were uh, a wealth of information about, um, you know, kind of the road that we're looking to go down. They've recently been down in their school districts. Um, and then there's just a ton of information on, um, you know, the state website and the Vermont uh, Department of Taxes, just kind of synthesizing things. Um, so I want to do some kind of comparison. I mean, you saw the numbers for our um, bill that we uh, approved and that uh, that 30, what was the number I said to pay attention to? 38 million. It's cheaper than the other two uh, school building from a, uh, from a construction standpoint. And I think part of that has to do with both Winooski and Burlington are doing renovations to existing, high, uh, existing school buildings. You saw that our most expensive option was that kind of, you know, build on thing. And the reason that they did that is because they're both space constrained. We're not, right? We have the luxury of being able to move over to a new site that has the benefit of potentially you know, saving us a lot of time and not uh, disrupting kids. So I think that's a great thing that we've got going for us. Uh, other things to kind of call out is um, you know, going to a, a bond vote, Winooski, they passed their bond by 22 votes, right? Can you imagine? Uh, I talked to Mike and he, uh, Dick Carroll, their, their school board chair, and he, he said skin to the teeth, um, but uh, they, they got it passed, right? Um, and, uh, uh, but again, they've got you know a, a good amount of work in front of them, and um, you know it's just kind of the start of the process. Burlington is a different story. Um, they're looking at a high school renovation. Their high school serves about a thousand kids. Um, they, there's a lot of backstory up there in terms of political developments, but they passed their vote. Uh, Seventy-three percent of voters um, voted for it, right? And I think uh, a, a big part of that was a big education push with uh, leaders in Burlington, including the mayor, who's a graduate of this school, right? Which is pretty cool. Um, anyway, um, so those are kind of some, some uh, points. So how to pay for a new bill? What were the kind of sources of funding that we've considered? This, I don't think, is an exhaustive list. If others have ideas, we're happy to look into them. The, one, the two that I have bolded are around things that we've looked into, right? The municipal bond we'll talk more about. I've got numbers that we've run on that. And the state match, um, this is uh, one of the, the bad news findings that we found, is that Vermont actually has statutes on the books that uh, provide for a 30% um, match for uh, school construction. Unfortunately, that's been uh, non unfunded for 12 years, right? There's a House bill uh, in Montpelier right now, uh, House Bill 209. Um, Charlie Kimball from Woodstock is one of the bill's sponsors to reinstate funding. Uh, but uh, we can't hold out hope that, you know, that's going to... Uh, going to pass. Um, when I talked to, to Mike DeCaro up in Winooski, I said, well, look, you guys already passed your bond. Are you concerned that you're going to miss out on state funding if that becomes available? And he said, no. Uh, the way that the statutes work is um, if you have an active uh, project and you have bond costs, then the state matches them. So if it gets reinstituted, then any active school project would be eligible for those, um, you know, those funds. He's talking to Charlie Kimball. He says, if we're going to come down to, you know, if that ever passes again, what the language of that legislation is. So, and those aren't, you know, can't put too many eggs in that basket, but at the same time, it's probably not something um, to, um, you know, to lose hope on just because we decided to go forward. That's what we decided to do. Um, okay, um, the double counting issue. Okay, first, let me kind of explain it. This is a little bit thick. There's a, uh, kind of a lot of words on the slide, but essentially, the way that Vermont uh, the education finance system works is that all school districts um, pool their money at the state level, right? And uh, the state kind of you know sends those funds back to school districts to pay the costs of, of running schools. 
Um, the uh, state also sets a limit and says, okay, it's really all about equality. This is Act 60, Act 68. Uh, and they say, you can't spend more than, uh, right now that number is, is 18,311 per student, right? Last year was 18,000. Our per student spend is uh, just shy of uh, 18,000 at this point, 17 something. Um, so the, uh, if you go over that, then what, there's, a, there's a double counting, right? Every dollar that you spend over the threshold, you have to send two to Montpelier, right? So it's incredibly expensive. When you're talking about a bond or uh, school construction and you know, numbers like you know, $68 million, then are we gonna have to do a bond for you know, $136 million in order to, to pay? Well, the answer to that question is allowed no. According to Brad James, we looked at the state statutes and uh, he con uh, confirmed that um, you know, school construction projects are exempted from the double counting mechanism. And you can see the statutory language at the bottom of this slide. Um, education spending, by definition, uh, for, for purposes of, of calculating the, the penalty provision, doesn't include approved school capital construction. Now, it has to be approved, and there are folks that uh, we got contact for and uh, have the process for um, you know, getting our project um, you know, approved if we get to, once we get to that point in the process, and that'll be important. So, so yep. that the approval is not the voters' vote, it's no, the state. it's the state. And it's a, it's, in talking to, to Brad James, his point was it's really just a sanity check. You know, it's not like a high bar, but right. they want to make sure you're not putting in I don't know, a space program or, you know, something exorbitant. Because you have to remember that, um, you know, even school construction, this is something of a misconception that we all had at kind of at the start was, um, we thought that, you know, the Act 60 stuff was just about the cost of running the school. There's no distinction. Uh, the money that it takes, your, your capital improvements are all part of the same budget. And he said, that was one thing that Brad told us was, no, it, it's, it's part of your education spend, it's just exempted from double counting, right? And that's a, a, a pretty significant... Uh, distinction. So the state does want to check that stuff. Another thing that came out of that conversation was, um, and this is intriguing, we talked about uh, private funding being an aspect of the, the new school project, but um, any, so education spending, before you talk about exclusions, the definition of education spending does not include um, private money that you use to run your school, right? <coughs> so from a programming standpoint, and Mary Beth, you and I have had conversations about this, I know Paige and I have, if you can do some kind of um, interesting or innovative sorts of investments in, right. in program, right? This, this is probably the time to be thinking about that while we're you know, looking to do you know, potentially a, a, you know, a private uh, fundraising campaign, maybe not put all that money into the, the, the build itself, but to, to use it to bring the cost of operating the school down, to keep teachers in the classroom, what have you. Those are things that we're gonna wanna uh, definitely think about. Okay, um, moving right along, what other questions? Um, how does it work, right? Like um, having a, a school district post Act 46, we got seven towns, we have to go to seven different town meetings, one town doesn't vote for the new build, where does that leave us? Good news on this front as well, uh, Paul Giuliani, Bond Council, it's a single Australian uh, rules vote across the district, um, and, and it's a simple majority, right? So that simplifies things incredibly. Another aspect of that is that you could do, you don't have to go to town meeting, this could be a special. In fact, Winooski and Burlington both did special votes for their school bill. And the kind of the takeaway there, uh, I know there's a lot of kind of urgency around the project, we certainly need to do our, our homework and, uh, and due diligence to make sure we do everything right, but um, not having to go to seven different town meetings or get seven different towns on, on board uh, gives us the, the ability to potentially go faster, right? If it's a single majority vote, then you know that, that kind of helps the, uh, the urgency. So good news on that front. Uh, now, uh, questions remaining, kind of switching topics. Those other aspects of the funding, you know, things that we you know, need to look into. Um, you know, in talking with Jason, he's kind of spearheading the, the private you know, fundraising aspect. Um, and there's, you know, I think a lot of potential in a place like, you know, um, in our, our district, we've got so many second homeowners. I'm going to get into you know kind of the, the the pieces of the puzzle in terms of who who participates in bond funding and who doesn't. But just to skip ahead a little bit, your non-residents, your second homeowners, aren't affected by a bond, right? Um, their their tax rates don't, don't change, um, but they do become you know great targets to say, hey, this wonderful thing's happening in, um, at the uh, at the middle school and high school. You know, what do you you know? How about putting something in the in the hat for the for the project? Um, other you know, I, Jason could speak a lot more about you know, how, to, how to run an effective private capital campaign. Uh, federal funding programs, we've barely scratched the surface of this one. That's something we need to uh, definitely look into. 
And then another, op this is just an idea that's gotten thrown out. Uh, Massachusetts, for instance, um, matches, I think it's, what is it, 30 or 50%? Most of about, about 54%. Yeah, and they fund most of that school construction on a, um, it's at the state level, it's an uh, option tax, it's a penny on the dollar for, for sales tax, right? And they, and they can do some pretty incredible things there. Obviously, they've got a lot more commerce going on in, in Massachusetts. But I don't know if that's something that, that um, we will um, ultimately be able to do. Um, in, you know, and let's be honest, like who, where's most of the commerce? I mean, you walk around Woodstock today, you might think that we've got a lot, right? Because the, the folks are here, but it's the mountain, right? That's, and, and, uh, from my understanding, Clinton's had local option taxes in the past and um, they've done away with we them still because- do. You still have one in place? We have rooms, meals, and rooms alcohol. And oh, right, we get the same one in Woodstock, um, right? It's, an, it's a local option tax and we have rooms, meals, and alcohol. Yeah. We don't have sales but we tax. don't have it on lift tickets. Right, right. So, we so, had it, but yeah, so that's something that we haven't scratched the surface on that, you know, in terms of the, the financing option. If we felt that was uh, important enough, we could, you know, uh, kind of direct some more time towards that. So here's the big question. Uh, if the bond passes, how much will education taxes go up in the district? I'm calling this TBD because I am, I'm going to highly qualify this. And there's a few things that everybody needs to know is that, uh, you know, calculating any given individual Vermont taxpayer's education taxes requires an evaluation of over 20 different factors, right? It's, it's, so it's potentially highly individualized. That said, there are some factors that you know, kind of get you in the ballpark, right? Um, how much is your total spend for the district? How many equalized pupils do you have? Mary Beth, you had uh, 1,024 at the, at the uh, total students, but how many equalized pupils does that translate to? Do you know? I don't know, and Mike probably, you probably don't have that yet. No? no. Okay, I've used that number for yeah. the, the slides, and the these things. Um, yields, uh, there's, you know, taxpayers essentially, the folks who, who live here full time, or, you know, majority of the time, the, your homestead residents, pay based on either their, uh, their property value or, you know, their income, and the state sets um, amounts called yields that are kind of, a, go into formulas that determine how much your tax rate is, right? So that's a huge piece of it, and those are uh, set by the state each year. And then your common level appraisal. Uh, every town has got, um, you know, a, um, there's a, I can't remember the, the exact CLA. phrasing for it. Yeah, well, the CLA, but there's a, um, uh, basically an evaluation of property value. Yeah, thank you, Grand List, yes. But the evaluation of property on an annual basis that basically says, are you guys assessing consistent with, you know, um, fair market value of your, well, of your, of your um, uh, property values? And there's a, a factor that gets applied to each town. So it's not going to be the same for every town across the district, but those are published by the um, Department of Taxation. Um, like I said, it really comes down to non-homestead. You know, those, those folks don't, um, don't participate in the bond. Don't, their, their tax rates aren't, um, aren't uh, changed. Your homestead taxpayers do. Depending on how much money you make, um, you know, how much do you pay, uh, it gets pretty complicated because there's some kind of um, combinations that happen at various income levels. But uh, kind of as a rule of thumb, above 150k um, folks in the in the uh, district are going to be based on their going to pay based on their property value, and um, you know over say um, 50k, um, it's going to be a matter of uh, income um, that they're they're paying on as a as an alternative uh, property tax income sensitivity. So uh, this slide looks different because I took it from Burlington. And this is the information that they put out to their taxpayers. Uh, again, massive disclaimer, Burlington has a lot more students than we do, right? So that's the single most important factor when you're looking at uh, education spending and tax rates. But as you can see, the, for the largest um, portion of their bond in that 28-year you know, span between um, 2023 and 2050, people who have a, are paying on property tax with the property value of 250K would see their taxes go up about 300 bucks a year, right? Yes, Jim. So Burlington's so different. I feel it's, yeah, I'll we should be there. careful with this because yeah. not only do they have 1,000 students, but they also have a population of 43,000. Mm -hmm. So their tax base mm -hmm. is much. Yeah, that's interesting. But you when know, you think about it, um, and this is one also kind of like a misconception uh, that we, uh, just in terms of how you think about the bond, there's not like a, a dollar for dollar sort of um, correlation between the, the amounts that the uh, school district owes on a bond for bond service and um, how much um, is paid by taxpayers in the district. And what I mean by that is that it's the state education fund that pays the bill, right? 
And um, so when we pass a, if, if we were to pass a bond, it would, be, it would become part of the state's education budget, just like the rest of our budget. I said earlier, there's no difference between buildings and everything else. And the only thing that changes locally is our tax rates, right? So I'm not trying to say that, um, you know, we, we're not going to pay our fair share, or that we're even going to come out ahead on the thing. We, we might break even, we might pay more than the, the debt service on the bond. But it's not a function of kind of tax capacity or number of folks in the well, district. Well, let me, let me ask you this. I, I don't have sure. the same notebook I had at the last meeting, but at the last meeting, or the meeting in Reading, I don't remember if it was last, but Mary Beth had um, a figure that um, was based on the Prosper Valley uh -huh. uh, 550. Yeah. And basically for a $300,000 uh, property, the increase, I think, was $25. So you got to look but at the. But just bear with me. Sure. And so I might have dollars that. Dollars or percent. I might have that dollars. I might have that a little bit wrong. But what I had done then is calculate that up yeah. to sixty million to okay. see. And obviously it's not going to be. Where were you in our, our working sessions? I know. <laughs> I should be there. Yeah. She's um, in policy. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I'm in policy. <laughs> but, um, anyway, for 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 that, which is very loose and very rough, and not you know. Sure, but yeah, it's a lot, especially if you tried to pay a bond off in what was right. it, five years? So that years, would be a $3,000 increase. That's a difference of that. Did that, I, would, and I, I think it was eight. I, I'm yeah, just saying yeah. that yeah. I think that we really need to, before yeah. we have this discussion, it, it, and I'm just see saying real numbers. It, the well, life of the bond matters. That was an eight year bond. This is a 30. Okay, so you have okay. a lot more time to pay something back. This, but Burlington's numbers are roughly uh, equivalent to the numbers that I'm going to show you in a second. They are higher. Um, six, uh, 70 million, uh, four, four percent interest, right, uh, and uh, 30 year life, right? Those are the, the uh, kind of assumptions that go around with the bond. Okay, so uh, what do we come up with for our school district? Like I said, it's different for, for each town, but we can start with the 68 million dollar number, you know, heavily, uh, I could do these slides after if you like. Um, uh, the, uh, the, if you use the 68 million dollar figure, uh, 50 thousand dollars worth of income, 250k worth of home value, your, uh, and you use the 1,024 uh, students, you just say those are the same as our equalized students. Your tax impact, let's just pick somebody, a uh, resident of Killington making 50K a year is gonna see an increase of 173 bucks a year. So more than twice what, um, you know, what they're, they're seeing up in, in Burlington, right? Um, but at the same time, you know, make your own decision about how impactful that is, that's gonna be to your, your uh, friends and neighbors, constituents. Um, from, on a uh, 250k of home value, somebody in Killington is going to see their home value go up uh, 532 bucks, right? So 175 on the on the 50k worth of income, um, 550 or so, 530 for that. Um, kind of keeping going with that. Um, one of the things you may remember from uh, Lee Sherwood's presentation, the architect, is that the architectural figures that they come up with are outside numbers, right? When you get an RFP out there and you get a construction firm in, they compete for these things, we can expect the total number to come down, right? Uh, a, uh, you know, getting money in from a, from a private capital campaign would bring the amount of the bond down, right? So if we adjust the amount of the bond from 68 million to uh, 55 million, right? You can see those numbers come down pretty significantly. That's the single most impactful thing in terms of moving the needle is the amount of the bond. So, it, uh, yeah, man. So why is Bridgewater so special that they've been before? It's such a desirable place to live. Well, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm just curious. It's, it's your CLA. Your CLA basically has said, uh, you know, you guys, um, you know, your, your property values aren't, um, you know, in terms of what you're uh, assessing, it's, it's not uh, consistent with fair market value, right? That's what the state's so determined. So they just went through Bridgewater this year. Mm -hmm. so with everybody. So does that change it? No, it, this happens on an annual basis. The CLAs get updated. And they, uh, Burlington, one of the things that they're wrestling with is a CLA of, when I talked to their uh, school board, of uh, 77 uh, cents on the dollar. Basically saying, you guys are, your assessment is way below. And so their tax rates are you know, uh, through the roof up there on that basis. Not that, uh, I'm sorry, but if we're going to talk taxes and CLA and all this other stuff, let, let's get the right, the right facts out. The state of Vermont has a system that's called Common Level of Appraisal, CLA. So if your house is on the, on the grand list today for $80,000, but the houses are selling for $100,000, the state of Vermont says you're at 80% of a CLA, okay? 
So all they're doing is bringing your value of your house because your town's listers have not brought the property up to the correct level. It's made it so that you're equal to everybody else. No one's taxes are blown out of the sky. You're at $100,000, and that's all they're doing. So what they end up doing is saying the tax rate is $1.42, and they say, well, since you're only at 80% of what the houses are really worth in your area because your listers have not gotten the numbers up, we add 20% on. What happens, though, is in your town, you're actually paying 20% less than what you're really supposed to on your municipal tax rate. If the CLA is at 110% of, uh, if that's what the state says, your $100,000 your, your $100, house is really only worth $90,000. So they say you're at 110%. So they take 10% off. Well, you can look at Reading's number. And that's one of the reasons that they're as low as they are. Yeah. So I mean, you know, um, I'm going to let you finish. Thanks, Jim. But I mean, it's the, 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 just let's not... Let's not bring the CLA into this. It's just it's not it's not worth bringing CLA into it. It okay. really is. I'm not going to dwell on it, but appreciate yeah. you straightening okay. the record. Um, if you if you get your number of students, uh, just kind of moving from slide to slide, I've got uh, two more here. Um, the uh, you know, our current uh, number of students on that 55 million dollar um, uh, debt. Um, if you move that to just 1,100, again you see the numbers come down. And if we were able to you know get 1,300 students in the district, kind of planning for growth, bold strategy those numbers come down even more, right? So I think that's, uh, and I've, I've got these formulas, I'm happy to share these with you know, anybody who's interested in, in getting them. Um, in terms of next steps, one of the things that the Configuration Committee, and Bryce, I don't know if you want me to uh, turn this over to you, but um, this is just uh, kind of uh, back of the envelope where we see the next steps. Paige mentioned the board retreat. We think this is an important topic that we should all be uh, getting up to speed on in terms of uh, talking points, communication plan, um, you know, really uh, getting the, the effort focused. Um, obviously, you're going to keep up uh, talking to folks around the state who know this stuff, right? Um, stay in close contact. I uh, have to do our public outreach. Um, you know, a bond vote would be, be great if we could get that uh, um, everything ready for a bond uh, by the spring time frame. Uh, I think it may be, um, you know, March is our town meeting, so uh, you know, April, May time frame would be wonderful for a special. Uh, private fundraising, um, that's, uh, you know, Jason's uh, looking into that. That's obviously an aspect that's going to need to keep going. RFP process that I talked about uh, earlier about getting a construction firm in, clerk of the works to do the do the uh, uh, kind of the management of the project, also very important. Um, developing the project plan and budget, and then you know breaking ground. Um, so that's all I had. Uh, I think I took a bunch of questions as we went. Uh, sorry if I went over time. Uh, questions. Uh, yeah. Oh, I want to take a little, Claire. <laughs> I was just going to say thank you. I mean, you clearly did a tremendous amount of work, and uh, you talked to so many people, and I'm just impressed that you, sort of, thanks for going the extra mile. That was really informative. Sure, for the village. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Family. Um, two things. One is for the retreat, it would be really helpful if we could see those tax numbers mm -hmm. um, as percentages, percentage sure. increases. Yeah. Because um, I know a lot of folks think that way. Yeah, you know what's great is um, Burlington's got all that stuff on their website. Mm -hmm. uh, it's out there right now. Mm -hmm. And they took it from a lot of different angles and we could probably copy what they did in terms yeah. of what we put yeah, out there. I think that would really be helpful. And um, also I wondered, um, do you have income tax increase in there? And I was wondering, is that some sort of calculating of the prebate or something? Because I don't... Yeah, that's that's one of the more kind of complicated aspects of the education but that's why finance system. Okay. I just but, yeah, the, in, so it, it's a property tax. Our education funding system is based on property tax. But folks who don't make uh, $147,000 a year pay an alternative tax, right. right, based on their income, 2% of their income, essentially, versus a dollar on every, um, or whatever the tax rate is on $100 at home value. And those, and then the your prebate, your additional credits apply to folks making less than $47,000. So that's just an average of what the prebate would be based on an average income? Under? Not, not part of it. This is why at TBD on the final figures, we have a lot okay. of kind of sharpening okay. the pencil to do okay. that's one aspect of it we're not gotcha. covering. And I think a, a great idea for um, one of the things that we can talk about more at the retreat is when we're getting information out to the public, we want to have a complete kind of picture. I said there were 20 factors that go into calculating any given individual. I'm not saying we use real people, but let's use some scenarios. Maybe take five different you know, snapshots of people around the district and say, this is how this individual with this particular profile will be impacted by the uh, uh, passing a bond at X amount. I think it's really important, too, for everybody to read the material that you have been given tonight so that 
um, you're even more in tune to information out there on health of buildings, um, what the architectural uh, plans looked like when they submitted them, um, how they evaluated our existing building, and also come with questions. Be prepared with questions. You know, I, I think that Bryce and Ben really were trying to um, kind of just sum up where what we charged them with in June, but I think it's really important that we bring as many questions as we possibly can think about. Talk to people in your, in your town so that you can bring questions from your townspeople as well, um, so that we're, we're, we're really prepared with the process. Yeah, and I just, I just want to say this is a good example of what I stated earlier. You know, our, the configuration committee was tasked with multiple things, holistic campus planning, uh, TVPS in particular, the middle high school builds, there's a lot going on. So forming this working group, the list of names that Ben brought up in the beginning has been an integral part of you know, collecting this information so they can then come to the configuration committee and come to us as a full board and real deal to talk about this. I mean, if we were trying to only do it during um, you know, monthly <coughs> configuration committee meetings or something, we would never have achieved all this and being able to reach out to all those individuals and stuff. So I really appreciate all the work that's been put in. So, Paige, yeah. I was just going to offer, I think maybe another document as I'm thinking about it, that you've got a document here that talks about facilities, <coughs> one related to health issues, but there's a third report that was related <coughs> to educational space and what we know about that mm -hmm. um, and you know along the way that's been handed out but it, you know it's been drinking from the fire hose so it may be what I'll do is send out to all the board members also what was what was found as we did the, the study around what kind of education space we need for our students our teachers were heavily involved in that particular report. You know, so I, I just yeah so I mean, I don't want to blindside you. I'm for this, so let's not take it wrong or whatever, okay? I just want real numbers out there, and I want real facts. And, and, and I'm in Killington. You could forget about the local option tax, sales tax, comment. If you want, if you want to introduce that, that's, that's a single town vote each vote. That's mm -hmm. not around the whole district. You will, that will not go through for a school project. I can, I can guarantee you that. I mean, there's been enough arguments in town of Killington to get rid of it, okay? Non-residents do not change. That, 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 that's not true, okay? What, what happens is, is that the state of Vermont has a budget, and it comes out, and so if you're a non-resident, and a non-resident, it's not non-residents, it's non-homestead, right. okay? So I, I'm a resident in Killington, but I own three properties in Killington that I am a non-resident on, okay? Jennifer, you own one. Okay, so, but the, if, if the budget in the state of Vermont goes from 1.7 or 1.8 billion and everyone wants to build schools and it goes up to $2 billion, they, they, then they send out. So th that rate does change based on what the total is. Okay? Sure, on the total, but the, so, so, the local so, level it doesn't change. Well, no, the non-residents will change. You said non-residents do not change. Yeah, they don't change as a result of the, of the district passing a bond vote. Well, no, they, they change. They change upon all the districts passing bond votes. That could happen. But yeah, no, I, I, no, no, I'm just saying, let's not say that. And like I said, I'm for it, but also the $400,000, so somebody that's making $50,000 a year, mm -hmm. if they live in the town of, let's say, Woodstock, and, they're, and they've been here for, I don't know, 50 years or whatever, and their house is being appraised currently at $650,000. Different situation. The first four hundred thousand is taxed at the homestead value. The two hundred and fifty thousand, they do not get a break on. Correct. This is the stuff that we need yep. to. When we went to that Saturday morning <coughs> meeting that I spent my whole day at, I thought we were going to get a little bit further, get state approval to make sure first that the state approves the plan. That would be one of the huge things that I would want to see. Okay local sales option tax is not going to work, okay? Non-residents, they can change if the whole budget, a 30-year a, a note for $70 million, let's say the interest rate 4%, I mean, the town of Killington is getting rates at 2.25%, so I don't know why we're paying 4 but 
let's say the thing costs ninety million dollars total with principal and interest. We're talking three million dollars a year over thirty years. That's not going to do much to a one point seven billion dollar budget. That's what you're talking about. Correct. But it can change. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> my biggest concern is why I joined this board. How many years ago did you get me on here? Seven, eight years ago. I'm here for the students. So what I want to see is that when I see $68 million for buildings, what are the kids getting to use to educate them better than they are today? You show me that, I really don't care if my tax rate goes up a thousand dollars, what your numbers are you're saying there, uh, that'd be two hundred fifty thousand. I mean, I got it. That's six times. I have to go six times that amount. You got but it. I don't care. We're here to teach our kids. Okay. So if we build this brand new building with windows that are going to help them, I don't really care about that. I want to know what's inside the building, what technology we have, what the teachers have. I've been here for how long, Paige? Seven years, like she Seven said. Years. But I've been arguing for get our kids books for the summertime, math, science, English. They do it at Killington Elementary School. They come over here. We don't have it. My kid goes home with no work in the summertime. Okay? I want to see that. I want to see the programs expand. The building does not scare me at all. If you really understand it, something like 80% of the people in this whole district you're not going, if they get the state approval for the building, you're not going to see your taxes go up because 80% of the people in this district are receiving prebates and rebates, and that's based off your income. It's about 70%. 70%, yeah. okay. So basically, if, it's, if you get the state approval, we live in a democratic country, right? You're going to get seven. If you could prove to those people that they're still going to pay 2% of their income no matter what, they're going to vote this thing in. <coughs> That's it. Yeah, I, did, I just want to say, just, just to unpack a little bit of that and then maybe move on, but is that, one, this is just a financial presentation. So I, I totally appreciate what you're saying, and I agree with you, Jim, as far as what are the kids getting out of it, I think, is really what the whole conversation is about. This is just showing a broad overview of the financial part. There's a lot of different variables that we're trying to give a very brief overview and 20-minute time period to, to show. But as you said, there's there's 20 variables, right? There's all these different combinations and stuff, and and it's also that's you're always going to have to you're never going to have exact numbers because you don't know what the CLA is going to be. I know you don't want to talk about CLA, but you don't know from year to year. And we're also we always have to disc have a disclaimer saying based on current Vermont state tax law, right? Because it could just change next year. So, I mean, I think I think the the idea is to give people that ballpark figure, and I think that we can flesh it out for a better public presentation based on some different groupings and stuff, so people can get an idea. But but yeah, if you're going to think in terms wise. of outcomes, so that's where this article is really helpful because it talks about how you improve the student experience, and it is all about how students do better academically in a healthy building. In and a so healthy just, building, and, and I like also I, think what Mary Beth has in terms of. I, I don't want to argue on a healthy building. We can have a healthy building, but you have a sixty-eight million dollar <coughs> healthy building. What's in it for the kids? And if we're going to tell our tax base people that the rate is not going to go up because we're going to put this building up. And I would like to see it get approved, folks, but if we're going to put it up and it's not going to go against your per pupil spending, okay, well, when you start putting other stuff in the building for your healthy building, like books and more electronics and all that kind of stuff, that will raise. So I want to see what we're going to do to teach our children on top of it to get my vote. That's all I'm telling you. I'm for the building, but I want to see what's inside of it. That and will get I, my I complete vote. That has to, we have to dive in deeper then into the conversation at our retreat. You know, I want a Mercedes, but I can't afford it. But is it going to help me drive better? I mean, I need other stuff inside of it. Okay. I mean, that, I'm sorry, but I want to know the complete plan. I don't want to tell my people in my town to vote yes for a building, and it's not going to increase your taxes. And then all of a sudden say, oh, I forgot to tell you that we're going to add $5,000 per pupil spending, and that's how you got your tax rate up. I'm sorry. But okay. That's what I need to know. We hear you, Jim. Melina? Mm -hmm. I just, yeah, just wanted to um, finish by saying 
thank you again, Ben and Bryce. But if you have a chance before our retreat, whenever that is, to go to the Burlington District website, they have a really great timeline on you know how the process started and then how they, like a running narrative of everything that they put out to the public, including things like Claire's you know, health report, facilities, why, the whys, and you know, all the benefits from just you know, structural to educational uh, for students, for staff, and I think it's really important to look at that anymore next week. I can piggyback on that. There's actually a great question. And Jim, you're not wrong. I mean, uh, Miro Greenberg. Oh, I know that. Yeah. <laughs> the Burlington mayor had the exact same question. He's like, new building's great, but we need to understand how this is going to improve student outcomes. Right. And th right. that uh, their superintendent did a great job of answering that, and I think it's something we need to look at can, and think about. Can we bring those uh, questions and answers to the Oh, industry? absolutely. Yeah, that'd be I great. I think that would be incredibly helpful. I think we should be pre-read material for everybody. Yes. It's not long. Yeah, it's I just think two or three pages. And, and is it, there's the also system. material um as well about the the mayor of burlington who also did a q in it in an a session mm -hmm. from what i understand too if we could bring that material or share it with the whole board before the retreat i think that would be informational as well okay that would be great okay where where am i <laughs> where's sam hey Hello. 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 Hey, Hello. Hey, Hello. Hey, Hello. Hey, and Allison. Oh, yeah, we're here. Hi. Oh, okay. Can I have? We're going to do the consent agenda. Um, do I have a motion on the table uh, to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Do I have any questions about it? All those in favor of the consent agenda, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Consent agenda. Passed. Okay, you're on. We're on. All right. Yeah. Next time we're moving you forward <laughs> so you don't have to sit here all night. I mean, I would sit here all night anyway. Yeah. All right. All right. And uh, I'll give a quick introduction. So this is a, this is a great minds think alike sort of story. Um, and, and here's how it goes. Uh, last uh, spring, so after the AP test time, uh, three students came up to me, Sam Powers, uh, Allison Lively, and Alice Sperber, said we've been, or this is the post-AP time in our AP American Government Politics class. We're working on a project to look at student voice and student governance, uh, or including student voice in the governance of the building, the administration of the building. Simultaneously, the action plan, the strategic plan, was developing the Student Advisory Council. How can we get a body of students that can regularly come to the board and really re represent student voice to enough that the board can interact with them and think about how are our, our policies and decisions landing on kids? Kind of seeing that play. So kind of like two, two forces coming together nicely. Um, so Sam and Allison are here tonight. Alice could not make it. And they're gonna tell you their story about what they're doing to become really representative of student voice in the building and then kind of the long view stay on the board. So Sam Powers, now Sam Lively. Thanks. Can we move to the next slide? You want me to yes. the board? Yeah, yes. you got it. Be the right. slide. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, hello. Uh, I'm uh, Sam Powers, senior at Woodstock Union High School and Middle School. I'm also a senior, I'm Allison. Yeah, I didn't want to talk for her. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, as Mr. Spinell said, we uh, last year we had a, an idea. We wanted to increase civic participation in our school, uh, and we thought the best way to do that was to create uh, what we call uh, the Committee for Student Voice. And so we're going to talk to you about that today. Next slide, please. Yeah. Yeah, so um, my piece of the project that I did back in May and June was research on um, what are the benefits of having student voice in a building, um, and also a couple models that other schools should do that, but right now I'm going to talk about the benefits. Students who believe that they have a voice in their school are seven times more likely to be academically motivated. They're eight times more likely to be engaged, and they're nine times more likely to report feeling a purpose in their school. Those are things that we want our students in our school to be feeling, um, but that only comes when they say that they feel they have a voice. Unfortunately, the majority of students nationwide do not feel that way. Only about 40% of students feel that they're valued in their community. This is something that we think we can change at our school, and we know that there are going to be a lot of benefits to the student body as a whole if we do so. Slide. 
Yeah, so uh, we, this is my slide. Yeah, this is All right, cool. We divvied it up uh, earlier today. Um, so, uh, yeah, our, our four main uh, ideas were having uh, regular town meetings, so uh, similar to the format uh, that Vermont has its town meetings. Um, so having, having a, a lot of students participating in direct democracy, voting on uh, our, our, like our opinions on procedures, uh, or even uh, policies uh, written by the school board. Uh, and so we also wanted to uh, have kind of a, a student representative or, or several student representatives uh, coming to the school board, uh, reporting regularly on how your decisions are affecting us. Uh, we also wanted to uh, have open office hours for our administrators uh, to kind of uh, talk about you know, decision making and the re reasons behind decision making. Uh, and we also just wanted to uh, bring in maybe guest speakers. We wanted to uh, possibly doing do voter registration drives to kind of increase uh, overall student civic engagement in general. Yeah. This one again. Okay. Yeah, this is, oh, this is this is yeah. So um, the way that we've kind of come about of achieving these goals has been having town meetings. Um, that will be somewhat similar to the town meetings that you know real Vermont has in our towns. Uh, part of the reasoning of that was because we wanted students to be prepared to participate in those real town meetings in their community when they graduate, but also before they graduate. Um, so how it would work would be that students would be able to submit proposals before the meeting. We would review them and help them work through that proposal to make it something that was presentable at the town meeting. Um, at the meeting, uh, all of the students would be able to debate on it um, if they wanted to. We, would an we anticipate these meetings being very open to all of the students who wanted to so that they wouldn't have to be missing sports or clubs or classes or anything like that, um, but also not mandatory because we didn't want to force people to participate that didn't want to do so. Um, so in terms of students being able to propose issues that actually take change in the school, they'd be able to do that and we'd have votes on it. Um, but we also anticipate using them as a means of gauging student interest in other issues. So if there are some questions that we have for them about how many students feel this way, we think that we can use the town meetings to do quick surveys so that we can feel better informed about how they feel as a group. Um, but the also, if, um, if you guys or the policy committee were working on an issue and you reached out and said, we would really like to know how students feel on X, Y, and Z issues, we think that we could use the town meetings as a way to introduce that idea to the students and get feedback from them on it that we could then present to you. Um, and then, as Mr. Smale kind of said at the beginning, it tied into the strategic plan goals. It was like bullet point number seven or something like that. <laughs> yeah, so I kind of started to talk about the connection to the school board. Uh, we'll be back on those dates. Those are already scheduled on the calendar, and we're super excited. Um, right now, obviously, we're kind of, it's the first time, so we're talking to you more about who we are and what we're doing. Um, but we anticipate that at the next meetings, we'll have things to present to you about um, how the student body is doing and how we feel about certain issues after we've had our first town meeting um, and, and that kind of thing. Um, we were kind of thinking that, you know, you guys, you know, a lot of you are parents, um, but you don't always see how your decisions as a school board um, impact the students in their day-to-day -day life. So we also think that we will be able to answer questions such as what does a school day actually look like for students um, when those questions kind of arise. Yeah, so uh, another piece is the open office hours, uh, really kind of uh, getting the administration uh, available for students. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of times there's a disconnection between uh, the decisions of administrators and the uh, the opinions of the students. <laughs> and so we really kind of want to uh, open it up to, to discussion with uh, the administration on why they made decisions uh, and how we could maybe improve upon those decisions. Yeah, so our first issues that we're really thinking of 
uh, tackling our green sheets, uh, our time, uh, and student privileges. Uh, and we really liked the way uh, the cell phone policy, uh, if you guys are, are you guys aware of what, how the cell phone, yeah, so the cell phone policy was kind of implemented in a way that we felt uh, was really represent, uh, similar to our uh, system where there was a lot of student feedback involved and we really liked that. Uh, but one problem with it was uh, it was very inconsistent because it was uh, by each advisory and it uh, wasn't kind of, it was not, an, uh, rep it could have been more representative of the student body's opinion. So we, we felt that this was a, uh, a better alternative to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, we were so honest. <laughs> Sorry. No. Um, so kind of part of this is also students talking to students. Those are all issues that we thought would have a lot of um, high student interest. Um, but we thought that we might be in a better situation to talk about them with the students than, say, their teachers because we could have more of an honest and open conversation um, without having it feel like an assignment or having it feel uncomfortable because um, we're their friends and, and all that, um, which kind of breaks down some of the barriers of talking to a principal or a, another administrator or a teacher that you don't know as well. Um, so we feel pretty strongly about, about that one. Now we can go to the next slide. Um, how is they updated? Um, that is more for the students and less for you guys. Um, but if you want to follow the Student Council Instagram, which is managed by the wonderful Alice Berber, go ahead. You can win uh, raffles at our Best Thursday meetings from their followers list. Yep. They have good prizes. Yeah. Right. Only students are eligible, though, right? Yeah. Yes, only students are eligible. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, I think that's okay. next slide. Right. Yeah, so just questions. Questions, anybody? Yes. So um, I saw in the last slide it said um, it mentioned student the student council Instagram, but I was going to ask how how do you envision student government interacting with this? Oh, I was waiting do for this question. Oh my um, god. <laughs> um, yeah. So <laughs> uh, really, our student government is uh, more, I would say, honorary than. Well, I don't know if I. I mean, they're more focused on. Um, <laughs> Sorry. They're more focused on event planning per se. Yeah. So they do they yeah. do fundraising. Fundraising. Yes. fundraising for Getting the class. a bench uh, for <laughs> another <laughs> bench. Oh, <so> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of benches. Uh, but yeah, they they haven't really been involved in kind of uh, procedures and uh, uh, policies of the school board. And so uh, I don't think th there may be an overlap, but really we want a uh, kind of a broad you know, uh, really direct democracy approach to this. Um, just yeah, one, just so, so Alice is the student council she is, president. She is, she's um, the and best. And she had an interesting point. She said that the way that the student council is set up right now is sort of they've described to the people who signed up for it to now say, this is part of your job too, didn't seem right. So it's more like, how will people find their way into doing the committee and this work in some way? So, but as far as that connection, it's really strong with Alice as the president of the student council. Right? Yeah. Um, but then also for the for the student council point, because anyone could submit a proposal, anyone can submit, um, anyone could go to the open office hours or participate in the town meetings. Um, any of the student council members or class officers who did feel really strongly about working on this, um, they are very much allowed to do so. Um, yeah. So any anyone who wants to be involved can be involved. And I know you said you were trying to figure out what the perfect time was. When do you think you're going to have these town opening? We think we're planning for the first one to be before Thanksgiving. Yeah, and during uh, the school day. Yeah, or, so yeah. Uh, we usually have best Thursdays, uh, and those are kind of like hour, hour half uh, long blocks in the middle of the day. Uh, and so we're we're thinking of replacing some of those with uh, these meetings. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Would the middle school be involved too, or just high school? Possibly. Possibly in later Something years. Um, we're, we're thinking for this year it will just be the high school um, and maybe we'll expand um, at some future time. Okay. Thank you. So that was part of my question. Was okay. Because I'm sure some of these, like the green sheets, for example, that affects everybody. Yes. So you said you were going to come back. Yes. On certain dates. Mm -hmm. I couldn't read them because you're standing in the way. <laughs> um, so I guess my question is, is this going to be like a 
an agenda deal where they have their own separate time now to present, or is it during mm -hmm. public? No, uh, they'll present. Yeah, we'll have during the agenda. Yeah. We'll be on the agenda. Okay. Yeah. So, I think it's great that you guys are doing this. Um, are you prepared for people to tell you no, even after you've done a bunch of work? Because I mean, for a lot of us, yeah, we have kids, and you guys are growing up, but. We're still your parents, and sometimes, like, you have to do the things that you don't like doing. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, are, are you prepared for that? Yeah, we're prepared for disagreement. Um, but, I, yeah. Well, some of the stuff ultimately falls with everybody here. And yeah. I mean, of course. Uh, we, we, we can disagree, we, but you may not get what you want. Yeah. Uh, we initially considered having uh, a possible addition of a student school board representative, uh, but we felt like it was this was, like, kind of the strongest way to voice our collective student opinion. So yes, we do understand that you guys will not uh, agree with everything uh, that we we bring to you, uh, but just know that it is the opinion of the student body. It is the opinion, collective opinion. And then to add on to that, um, that was kind of part of the reason that all of the town meeting proposals have to be submitted before the actual meeting, um, because in that process, um, we could kind of, I don't want to say weed out, but we could refine anything <laughs> that would not be serious or would not be acceptable, um, quite obviously. Like that. Yeah. I, I don't think anything brought to you will be at all uh, arbitrary. Okay. Yeah. I guess we'll find out. Yeah. Hi, guys. Hi. So uh, you kind of answered all of my questions already, but I wanted to say thank you. And um, as your, your, one of your former teachers, I'm not shocked to see you standing there. And I'm very proud, and so should you. And I look forward to seeing more of you. So thank you. Um, so yeah, I think this is so great that you all are doing this. Uh, I have just a couple of logistical questions. Um, in terms of getting other students involved, uh, are you meeting besides the town meetings? Are you having meetings to plan the town meetings? Are you having, you know, how are students going to find out about this? Yeah. Uh, so right now it's just us three mm -hmm. uh, because we kind of came up with the idea and we have to work out the kinks of the, the just general plan. Uh, we're hoping to kind of by the second semester uh, allow juniors uh, to kind of uh, move into into this like kind of right. leadership position yeah. and have. Uh, whoever whoever wants to be in th this is like this is a lot of work like we have put in a lot of time and effort um, into this project um, and so it's 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 difficult um, for a lot of students but we uh, we want uh, as much student participation in planning these meetings uh, as possible. Okay, great. And I just had one other logistical um, thing I thought uh, that Jim actually just mentioned to me. Are we policy meets at eight o'clock in the morning a lot of the times just when you're starting school, so maybe that's something to think about in terms of planning yeah. Yeah. Uh, getting out of class or that kind of thing. Yeah, that's that's why we're thinking kind of, uh, of having seniors be, be uh, a part of a part of this uh, committee, uh, just because yeah, we have a very flexible schedule. Oh my gosh, it's so nice this year. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to say thank you all, so this is really great, and I think that, that we need to hear more of a student, student voice that will make our work so much more meaningful. So thank you for taking the initiative to do that and to prepare this great presentation. I'm so, excited for you to come back. <laughs> so Paige, yes. we had before this board was formed, middle school and high school, always had a person from the school that sat in one of these seats. Yes. So I make a motion that we make a seat available for the students to start showing up, at least to sit here. And, and, and I mean, they would make a little presentation instead of making it that the person sits out in the hall, you know, sits out in the, the chairs or whatever, that they could be part of the meeting itself. The person did not have voting rights or anything else, but I would say that we give a seat and have Garen work it out the way it was once before to start. Yeah, and I think what where they really turned that up here with what they were doing is the person would come and present kind of happenings in the school, and what this group's really trying to do is make sure they're represented. So I think that please turned up with even greater power as far as having that voice to speak to them. So, so my motion on the floor to make a seat available for and let them work you know work it out the same way that it was before, guys. Yeah. 
Well, why don't we do this? Why don't we have Garen and this new com this new committee mm -hmm. work things through, okay, and that the seat will be available to them if if they so choose. Right. Mm -hmm. um, or make some sort of proposal to us. Yeah, so no, so that we can approve it. But I, I think that's a great idea. That would be a jump forward. So that's the yeah. first thing we work on with Garen, Mr. Schmell, to you guys, I guess, um, to try to get a seat that's here. Nice. Um, the other thing is, is would you allow um, mm -hmm. one of the representatives to show up? I think our, mm -hmm. our policy committee is uh, basically the third mm -hmm. Wednesday of each month. Monday. Monday, third Monday third of Monday. each month. Third, third Monday of each month at 8 o'clock in the morning. And that's, I'm not saying it's okay. I think you should talk to Mr. Smell about that. We discussed that. Yeah, but we're open for it. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you. All right. So um, the TPBS, um, both Bob and Patty. Uh, Patty, yeah. Nope. Sorry. Nobody's here. No, I didn't know nobody's here. Nobody's here. Patty and Barbara are here. Um, well, just, just an update on it is that um, we, we have uh, the $100,000 monies. You've, you've seen this in the packet. Um, right. In, it just to, to so that people are aware of where that money was targeted from. Um, there was some money in the, and I'm looking at package page 17. Yeah. Um, thank you. There's some money um, that was in the Pumpkin School reserves um, that we are able to tap into. Um, some money out of the Pumpkin operations budget um, that. Um, a lot of the, the, the monies there are actually going to West to help with additional custodians, but we feel like we can pull 25 from there. Um, and then finally, the, there'd be 25 that would come out of our hardware and software line, and we'll just have to tighten our belts around that um, in order to pull that out. But the, the combined amount, um, Mike and his team were able to identify about $100,000 um, should the, the board want to go forward. Can I ask the question? Yes. Um, can you help us just understand, Mary Beth, what the impact, if any, there will be on taking the twenty-five thousand dollars out of the IQ budget? I just don't know enough about what that yeah, so entails to understand how that impacts yeah. the student experience or the work that Ralph is doing. Yeah, so some of it, you know, exactly, he's got monies in there that can be used for refurbishing of, um, like, laptops, that type of thing, um, and, you know, updates for the, uh, like, hardware, software line. It's a little bit, I, I, I would make a comparison to your house, right? You may have a, lot, a line item for repairs, right? And if your refrigerator goes, just say, okay, I'm going to wipe out that line item, but, I'm, but going forward, if another repair comes up or another need comes up, I don't have the money there for it, right? That's that's the trade-off that you have. And maybe to make the, the new refrigerator repair, you have to take a little bit from your travel budget, right? So that's kind of what we're doing here, is we're taking a little bit from hardware software to bring it over, spending down funds. Um, it, 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 nobody has crystal balls. I would say there's no specific thing that money's <clears throat> earmarked for. Okay. Well, I'm I mean, I'm saying that, no, but I'm saying, is there a specific need that we would be spending that $25,000 on this year? So some of the yes. money that RAP holds that money for repairs on laptops and things like that. So he knows he has that in the budget. But it's more repair money as opposed to, do, we didn't have a purchase order. It's not, it's not there's a not purchase order money. that's currently out there. Right, and just so everybody knows that. Yeah. And that's for the laptops that each student is loaned during the school. It's a day. it's a general hardware software line, so okay. that those lines cover things like student um, uh, devices. It also covers um, faculty devices, right? I'm so just thinking a lot of the school board members who don't have children in this school yet, so may not know that all the kids get are given um, a laptop to use during the school day. Yeah. So my my question would be on top of yours there, Clara. Yeah. It would be more of so there's twenty five thousand dollars for IT hardware software, okay. Do we spend all of that money in a given year, or is this twenty five thousand dollars that is not spent? And if we do move it to, because we're going to have a vote, I believe it says here on this, 
if we do move it out of IT, hardware, software, and computers that our children are learning with start to fail, is it, sorry we can't get it fixed, we don't have the money? So it's, it's a portion, this 25,000 is a portion of, of a larger number. We're reducing it, I, I can look up but the exact I, amount. So my question is, is that what, so it's a portion, so what's the total of the portion? It's 25,000 of what? Okay, I mean, this is the stuff that I expect to have in front of me. Okay, you know, but hold on. But if it's 100,000, do we spend 100,000? Let him look it up on the line item. Okay. Uh, I'll look it up, Is that how much the total is? Okay. But there still are funds available. There are definitely great. still funds available, right. So anyway, the thing, to, you know, that I, I think is the most important thing to bear in mind, it's like your household budget, right? You spend it now, but then as it goes down, if you have future emergencies, that you know, you just know that that's that's already been tightened up. But we can't, you know, we, we are able to identify those funds. Um, we would not bring them to you if we didn't think we could manage without them. Um, but um, but every time we, we get the budget tighter, the board just has to be aware that okay, you've, you've cut here, you've cut here, you've cut here. So that gives us less room if there are bigger issues that that come up, but there is definitely been an analysis and felt like this is something that we could do without putting the district at risk in any way. And does this put the Prosper Valley building maintenance down to zero? That, um, that I don't know. I'd have to ask Mike around that. Uh, no, it's not a, a complete zero. Um, you know, we're, we're like 50 percent of the cost would come from the reserve, as you see in the top two lines. Yeah. That's already been. Uh, tucked away from previous years of surplus. Um, yeah, well, we consolidated. We all kept our reserves. I mean, I, yeah. I understand that, so I'm just trying to, you know, I'm thinking, um, I, mean, I, I guess we sort of don't know what else. You know, we're dealing, we're dealing with one issue at Prosper Valley, one, and if we reopen that, that building, there could be other things, and this is, you know, and that all well, other from that's 23k. That's just of all. Is it that like other all reserves. the other reserves for Prosper Valley? Do you think? Right. But we can we can hold a list of the different reserves. But I mean, one of it was the um, uh, the building maintenance reserve. Yeah. And the one the other one was the um, land fund, a Microsoft settlement, and the observatory reserve. So those, those four items is where we come up with the with the fifty thousand. And do those all get? Do those reserves all get zero? They'll, they'll all go to zero, right? But there'll still be reserves on Pomfret's um, balance sheet. But we are taking the bulk of them. There'll be a little bit. Money totally is in the Pomfret reserves. As we draw this down, there'll be about ten thousand. So there's sixty k right now because yeah. nobody's voted on anything. There's sixty thousand in total in reserve. Right. Okay. We, we were recommending we take 50 of that 60, still leave 10 on, take 25, as you can see from the, from the operations budget, of the operations and plant line, which is the maintenance and buildings, which we thought was prudent to this discussion. Right, right. Yeah. And, and then we took 25,000 of IT, that's right. a much larger number. And the 60K does not include the bridge money you are in here. It's, it's, it's not hitting into any... No. No. Right. no. There's 60K that's over there. Okay. And keep in, keep in mind, I just want to say, like, right right now, this is just my opinion, but the school's obviously offline, so we still don't have money in the reserve, but right now it's not even doing anything, so using it to try to get it back online, I think, is important. And also, if you were to look back, I think, last September 10th, like, last year, at Joe's report card, um, if you were to look at the condition of the building and stuff, things like the roof, the boiler, other things we always look at from, like, large expenses, uh, Prosser Valley didn't have any of those. It's, it's this, re this issue that we've been talking about, um, but the other issues are are not really there. It was more uh, the results from the security audit, things like cameras, work for the vestibule, things like that. So I would just say that I, I don't think there's any large concerns that we're aware of that would be on Joe's report card besides what we've been talking about. No, I follow that. I mean, it, but I'm getting at this 60K in the reserves, and then in the Pomfret FY20 operations budget, is there really only 25K there, or is there more? I think I might be able to help with that. I don't know the, off the top of my head that amount, but my understanding is that in that amount, there was for, was for custodial staff. Because the Prosper students are over at West, 
we would add an addition custodial support over there, so we're, we're paying that person through the Prosper Valley line. So the 25 represents the difference between what that, that additional custodian at West is, is doing and what was actually in that line on it. And I'm just building on what Bryce is saying, because I'm agreeing with him, that we're trying to get to see if this, <laughs> this will fix a situation over at the school. So if there's 60K total, and then 25,000 total in the operations, okay? That's 85,000. The operation budget is 85,000 for this year. 84,000, which includes, um, you know, there's an employee in there for a custodian, which we know they, don't, they got moved to West. Right. right? Yeah. So that's part of the budget. Um, so there's 25K left over. Is there more than 25K left over after you move that person over there? No. There's just 25. That's why they've got to pull from the IT. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. So, but, but we don't have to pull 25 from the IT because there's $60,000 in the reserves. And like Bryce said, th th this is a move to see if this will work and help over there. So take the 60 full K from the Pomfret plus the 25 is 85, and then take 15 out of the hardware, and that leaves 10 K in case something breaks down. That's all I'm getting. I mean, we're trying to move forward on it, and if Pomfret needs other monies to do something for whatever down the road, you know, so we're looking right now for 100 k This That's number here, for. you know, it's, it's 111000 but we think, but we think we're only going to need to go up to 100. Well, what we've got, we've, the so bids what, are, she was asking whether or not we would only have to go to 100. The bids are due tomorrow. Yep. Um, so you know, we know it's, 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 it's 101, Jim. It's not 60. It's 28 and 23. I asked the question and I got an answer. Oh, totally. I'm not looking at the sheet anymore. I'm asking how much. There's, there's 23 and 23 is 46. Okay, that's 46. It's right? a 20, that's an 8. Well, oh, that's an 8, so okay. Yeah. So 28 and 23 is 51, right? And I asked it's how much really... It's still leaving 10, yeah. I was asking how much really is in there, and I was told there's really 60. So there's really only 9 extra in there. But why are we just leaving 9 there? I'm saying use the full 60, use the full 25 yeah. from the other place, so you have 85,000. And only take fifteen thousand from the IT hardware. So if something does break down or whatever, we still have money for that refrigerator. That's all. So we're. I mean, basically, we just go all in and prosper. Yeah. We go. Everything goes down. Prosper is asking yeah. us to go all in. And no, I know, believe I'm, that we should. We should honor yeah. that. And and basically, this is in the in the long run. If this works, like they're saying, some people are saying it should, that it should dissipate the water away from it. Then we have a building that's completely worked for 100k. I just I just have a hard time pulling full 25k out of IT and there's 9,000 or whatever sitting over at Prosper. Prosper. Makes sense. I'd like to leave a little extra in the IT. That's it. I'm just one sure. person. I'm just questioning whether because some of that was the observatory. I don't know. Was that part of that was money that was raised specific for the observatory was then then set aside because of anything needed to happen with the observatory that's what i'm hearing and i'm not sure and with reserve funds if different portions of money have you know attachments to it right. Right. And right. so that would be my only caution if it you know when that was built it was privately funded there was lots of other pieces just as union arena has to have money set aside in case something that? happens e either way i don't we need to trust the decision that came out of the administration i feel like Obviously, the money is one pot of money. I know the reserves work a little different, and I don't want to buy just simplistic terms, but having some funds set aside if there are something that happens to the observatory, I don't think it's a bad thing. It's only 10K. They're saying the 25 coming out. I mean, they have, they have reasoning behind it, I guess, and I trust the administration, <coughs> that, that logic, um, because I'm assuming they feel like it's a safe bet to take 25 out of IT. Yeah, and, and Raf, who is the director of you know, IT here for education, he was very comfortable with this. We right. went to him, and he wasn't <coughs> opposed to doing for the cause that we're trying to do. Right. You're not taking the IT budget down to zero. That's 25 out of the IT budget. Yeah. It's right. not like we're yeah. stripping right. out of air. No, I, right. Right. I get it. Because I'm being told that it's going to be thin. I mean, um, Sherry, you just, uh, I'm just, whatever. You just brought up another question then, and you're saying that some of this money that's 
the 28 and the 23. You know, how much of it is in reserves that are for certain things? Are you pulling money from certain reserves? You know, usually for taking money from a reserve fund, you have to have a vote. And it's not the vote of, um, it's not the vote of this board, it's the vote of the taxpayers in that town. Do they want to, you know, because if they have money in there for an observatory thing, you know. Do we I know, know I, I just want to ask Mary Beth, do we, have Bob and Patty taken a look at this? I mean, I assume they know what they're, I know what my reserves and collections are for. We discussed that I mean, at the configuration committee meeting. Yeah, yeah. It, it was discussed in that at the meeting there was no concerns brought up and they didn't say anything to, to me specifically um, to bring up any concerns at this meeting. Okay. I was told and to Bob bring up other Patty things about that. Have nothing <laughs> has come my way. But, and they've seen this and I mean, yeah, yeah, this was this was discussed at the configuration meeting. And they're both members of that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And and from my understanding, I mean Patty's biggest want is for us to do the first stage of remediation for this building. Mm -hmm. So I I'm going to make a motion to move forward and approve the $100,000 as stated as in so we can have conversation in second, someone's got second. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to end with saying that I'm not going to vote. I'm going to abstain from the vote, and I would like my name to be saying that I abstain from the vote because I do not want to get caught into that all of a sudden someone from the town comes in and says, you, you voted for money that's in a reserve fund, and you didn't ask the voters if we wanted to take it out of our observatory thing. Just because we sit here and say we spoke to Patty and we spoke to whoever, that's two people in the town of Pomfret. They need to approve money being taken out of their reserve funds. I believe if, if it's specifically for certain things, sometimes you do. But I mean, I think yeah. that forty six when we voted, Jim, we all knew that our reserve funds would stay with our school, and in this case, though, you know, there there may be some restrictions on the money. But as long as these two reserve funds are being spent on Prosper Valley, I mean, I think that was what we all towns agreed to. You know, we wanted our reserves kept in our buildings. That's how it was brought to me at first when we first got this sheet. But Sherry brought up the part that when I was asking to take the other $9,000, that that might be specific stuff that cannot be taken care of. Yeah, I mean, you brought how about, it up. How about and, this, though? And it's we sticking can, in my head. We can, you I have I to think, vote. I'm just not going to vote on it. It's fine, but I think that we can make a vote which says we approve this money assuming it's not encumbered in any other you know there isn't any special any assumption that's made you know yeah. these reserve funds and they they have to be you know okay, right. contingent on any necessary approvals from the local so since nobody seconded my vote yeah, I mean, it, it my motion no, ben, I, I, I will remove my motion then seconded you Okay, Wait, so I'm sorry, can I just, I happen to have the Articles of Agreement on Perfect. my laptop right Perfect. here. Yeah. So, <laughs> Perfect. Thank what you. kind of nerd I am, but uh, <laughs> the original Articles of Agreement say, um, under, what number is this, I can't move it, but anyway, it says, the Windsor Central Unified Union School District shall assume any and all operating deficits, which just happened, sorry, 6B. Um, surpluses and fund balances of the forming districts that may exist on the close of business on June 30th, 2018. In addition, reserve funds identified for specific purposes will be transferred to the Windsor Central Unified Union School District and will be applied for established purposes unless otherwise determined through appropriate legal procedures. Okay. All those in favor of the motion on the table say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Um, let's move forward to the Barnard update. Um, what? We, we have Did a recommendation. Yeah. Oh, so <laughs> I don't. I just just to yes. piggyback. It's really about, it's still just to stay on um, the Prosper Valley School for a little bit. Um, I don't know if everybody's had a chance to read it, but I think it makes more sense just to just to, to read it, kind of emphasize certain points that came out of the, the committee meeting. Um, and just keep in mind, the committee consists of a couple board members. Uh, including um, Bob and Patty aren't here, uh, some administration faculty members and some other parents and some other residents in, in the town. Um, the configuration committee acknowledges that it's unlikely the TV, TVPS, yes. spelled right there on there, a building will be available for the students in the 2021 school year. At this point, the configuration committee does not endorse the superintendent's recommendation for TVPS. The configuration committee would appreciate greater time to gather the input from all impacted communities in order to make an informed decision regarding the programming. 
the committee continues to be committed to the re reopening of TVPS. The committee further recommends to the finance <coughs> committee and the full board the inclusion of the necessary funds in the FY21 budget to install and operate an HVAC system and include minimal costs necessary to purchase outdoor classroom space, example, year, to allow greater use of the outdoor campus. Um, so real briefly, I just want to say that even though it doesn't say it in here, I think it just goes along with what we were talking about. The committee definitely supports the idea of taking this next step and just worrying about the remediation. And I think this board, as well as the, the committee, have both recognized the value in the property. And that's why this is a really important next step that we haven't taken yet, and we want to move forward with that. The next one being that HVAC system that we know, regardless, it, it sounds like it's going to need but it's not a, not a huge expense, so that will kind of go to finance, I think, and, and talking to Joe and when we get these further evaluations and we can get actual numbers. Um, but we'd like to see that installed sooner rather than later uh, to start addressing the issue. Um, I don't know if Joe's not here to talk about no, he's not. the levels and stuff, but I don't mind probably speaking to the fact that they did do it. They, they did do some additional air quality readings um, as he was asked to. Um, and there was improvement in some areas of the, the building for sure uh, as far as to say as acceptable levels and there's some other areas that are still well beyond you know times over so um, just having the building being used uh, yeah being opened and having people back there again has, has helped but not enough so we know that it still needs work to be done there what's that there are people well op opening with like creating penalties you know he's had there's been crew there he keeps on telling us you know just opening things you know, making sure it's more in that used state, I guess, versus being locked up for the summer when we notice the issue. Um, so I just think it's important that the, the, you know, the committee really wants to do that. The recommendation from Mary Beth um, was something that because this committee was charged with holistic campus planning, TVPS, the middle high school, uh, we just don't, don't feel like without having some ground made up on this, without talking about some of the um, educational needs of the district as a whole maybe that it was appropriate to make that decision but just to focus on getting the building back online at this point in time so so what is your committee's um recommendation of opening the school as that's that's what we want more time we to discuss. Need more time because it depends there's a lot of there's a lot of things hinging as is you know this board didn't decide for example we kind of took out the, the committee's recommendation to move sixth grade to the middle school. So that's nothing we voted on here. This is for which is fine, but that could impact potential future uses of that building. You know, so um, it's hard to come right now to a conclusion like that where we say here's here's formally what we want to do. Um, but to be fair, again, I think both the committee and this board have recognized we want to use the building and the property. So get it back online. Um, the idea of the year what was kind of thrown in there was just because it's been brought up that. You know, it's it's a, still being used currently to some extent, but there's definitely some opportunity. And are there some inexpensive ways that we could use the property more in the meantime? Um, again, there could be something that happens. We get we get this work done, and all of a sudden the readings are great, and then maybe we have to speed up our timeline. But um, but we want to use the property and stuff as, as quickly as possible. And some of these dollar amounts we're talking about are are pretty minimal in the scheme of things. And again, the HVAC system for sure we won't know until get some more numbers from Joe, so we're just not, don't want to commit to that, but I think that just showing that commitment to the, the school and the property is what's important. All right, we'll move on. Um, Barnard update. Right. Um, can you, <laughs> um, okay, <laughs> so, uh, it's it, it, things are a little bit in limbo. I guess uh, so. I'm so in the weeds that it's a little hard to remember where we left off. But um, basically, uh, Barnard was planning on presenting to the SBE on October. Oh, this 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 Wednesday. <laughs> and in order to do that, the deadline to get our proposal to Donna Russo Savage was last Monday. And so everything was just we were trying really hard to make that deadline. Um, Barnard's lawyer was away on vacation, and and so um, Donna asked me to send um, a draft. She said, "Just send me a rough draft. Let me see it." She was being very accommodating, and so I did that. And then she said, "Oh, I'm so concerned about how you all are deciding to write these articles and how you're doing this. I think it's not good." And I said, "Well, both law both lawyers signed off on this, and I'm." sort of confused, and so it was all like, oh my gosh, like 10 minutes before this deadline, um, 
everything's all crazy again. But I mean, it's just really about legal language and um, how, how that gets decided. It doesn't really, it just meant that we didn't make that deadline and that um, basically the long and short of it is that both the Mudd lawyer and the Barnard lawyer disagreed with Donna Russo Savage when they came to uh, the table the next day and said they agreed with each other that things should be written differently, disagreed with her, they planned a, a phone call with her, then they got her on board with their ideas, and now they're all working it out and talking. And so the plan is that we will hopefully present at the November SBE meeting. So. Sorry, SBE. Oh, I'm sorry, State Board of Education, which is the we have to get approval for the, okay. for the plan. And so we, we hope that all of these, this legal language is worked out and that um, uh, what we would like to do is bring that proposal to get the endorsement of the board or at least a committee of the board or something. We, ha we really have to have something when we go to the SBE on November 20th. So we'll have to figure that yeah, out. It's, it's kind of crazy because like it, um, mm -hmm. The two lawyers were talking to each other and were fine, and then Donna Russo stepped in and was like, "No, I don't like the way it's going." And now they're the three of them are happy and working together. Yeah, who is this Donna? <laughs> <laughs> she's Donna. She's 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 legal she's the, Yeah, she's like the um, head, counsel. head counsel. But you have to present with their approval if 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 the um, you. It's so convoluted, in my opinion, because if Barnard said at their vote that they want to come in and we endorse them to come in, the state still has to approve it. It's, it's just But that's kind what of, the state wants. It, yeah, exactly. It's the way the statute is written. Whatever. But of course, I, good the lawyers luck. don't agree with that. <laughs> but Pamela has done all of the heavy lifting in this yeah, one, yeah. And, and literally, she sent me all these documents yesterday, <laughs> I mean last week, and I was like, I have to call you because this is mind-boggling, the amount of legal mumbo-jumbo that was going back and forth. And Pamela really just dug in deep and, and worked hard thank um, you. on this. So thank, thank you, you, thank you. And thank so you. we will be forward. moving forward. Just one. Yeah. Just one thing, and I want to echo as well the amount of time and energy that Pamela's put into this. <laughs> it's been um, remarkable. Um, I did feel I wanted to just relay to you just something that the attorney said the, the merge board should be aware of, and I think that we've been moving forward like this. But when when you put the policy in the articles, it means that if you want to change the policy, so for example, the like the annual report to the board. If at some point down the road you want to change that, that has to go back out to the voters when it's put into the article. So anything that's in the policies that are referenced here has to go back out to the voters. That's that's how we've been working, but our attorney felt, or the merge board attorney, he'll just be sure that the board is understanding that that's Because that's otherwise, if we change a policy, it's just all of us changing a policy. So this really, you know, there's a big impact if you all these, you have to put policies out to the voters. But I'm sorry. the only thing we're looking to put in as far as policy is the school closure and the reconfiguration. That's the only two policies we're looking. And I think, I mean, I think that's the foundation of what we're really trying to, that's something that every town wants to stick to. We're not trying to put something in the article that would be changed every third on year or fourth yeah. Yeah, it's, the, yeah. it's the foundation of what we all believe in, how a school should be looked at, how a school should, if it was to be closed, mm -hmm. how it should be looked at to be closed, how a school would be looked at to be reconfigured. And I think we've gone through a lot on that. So those two policies to make it in there. Um, the also, the other thing is, is that it's, it's once again, it's like what Bennett said, it's not each individual town, which was one of my concerns. It's, it's, it's a whole, Australian ballot because I don't want to set it. if we if, if this was that each town had to vote individually oh, my no. concern would be if, if, if one right. town says no they don't want to yeah. but this is as a whole yeah. so. right. I just want to move back because there's an important thing that I forgot because it's the end of the day and it's been a long day but um, 
talking about the Prosper Valley School, which is kind of something we, we, we spoke about, was that something like this, this change the statute and the importance of that, is one reason they wanted more time, because the committee felt it was worth it to take the steps that are outlined in the policy and have that public engagement piece and stuff, which we feel like if we made a recommendation now without doing that, and then we adopt as a district, you know, these, these statutes, we, we, we just weren't really holding ourselves to that, even though we kind of, that's the way we're headed. So we wanted to be fair and kind of support that process that we all voted to do, so. And I think also, you know, having sat on that Act 46 committee for nearly two years, I certainly think what, what you guys have done in policy, those two policies, that is what we sort of should have done in, a, in an ideal setting. When we, don't you think, well, you know, when we came up with these articles, we didn't flesh it out. You know, we just didn't know. We sort of were like, well, this, this might be what we do. And I think you guys have really put in the time you know, to, to really put together a well thought out plan. Like, you know, how would you close a school? You know, how, what would be the criteria? How would we look at it? And I think, you know, we just sort of, we touched on it in Act 46, well, you know, you know but we, we had, didn't Well, I think we had hoped, we, our desire was that the board would wrestle with that. Yes, that was, that absolutely, was the yes, no, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> but, I think, but I think it's really put together, you know, we didn't, we had a lot on our plate, but I look at, I look at these two policies mm -hmm. and I'm like, this, I think is what we would have right. ideally had. Mm -hmm. But we've evolved over time. Mm -hmm. And I want to so say Lou was a really big part of it also. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, strategic plan Thank strategy. You. Thank you. Right. Yeah. There's an update on another part in the strategic plan. So, so, I'm going to for you. so well, let's get this down first. Oh, I have one. Okay, so this is a, an update on, if you look in the, in the <coughs> left, upper left-hand corner, so the, again, the policy or the strategic plan piece here is to establish this leadership team comprised of parents, administrators, teachers, students, law enforcement, to really look at the issue of um, substance misuse in our facility and in our community, so kind of looking at that collection. So the membership you can see down below, these are the, the people we've met so far. Um, we still are working on ways to get students involved and, and primarily turn around a scheduling thing. So we're going to start to have some of our meetings after school hours where students can attend or maybe some variety of places. But this is kind of our, our core membership right now. So the group we've met, we met three times to get ready for this beginning of the school year to start up. And after this, we'll be meeting um, twice a month. That's kind of the, the period of the group. The place we've been working with, the shared place, is the, on the back side here. So look at the back is the label, looking for what's a, a grounding text for us to kind of base our work on and then kind of understand like what makes sense. So this is from, as you can see, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. What are some research-backed approaches to doing prevention programs in communities? So this is the, the shared document we've worked with. Go back to the other side. Um, the first thing that we did in the meeting was to make the statement of focus. And we wanted to make a statement of focus that gets at not just a just say no sort of approach, but really like what's the why behind it? What's the why really for a school or community? What is it that substance abuse really gets in the way of? How does it really get in the way of kind of a focus, doing school well, being fully engaged in the school community? So this is a, a statement of purpose that we developed to kind of guide our work. The next thing that we did is in that guidebook, I think there are 16, I think, mm -hmm. this clear, clear. about 16 different principles and individually we selected, which three do you think are the highest leverage for our community to focus on right now? And so from that, we came down with these four principles. So these are some of the, the principles we're using to, to guide our approach and, and what we're about doing our work. So you can read those and just get a sense of, of what are the, some of the, the things we've really seen that are important. And one that rings true in most of those is it's a partnership. Now, if we look at this as just being a school-based thing or just a community-based thing, it's not going to work well. So how do we really partner between the school, other aspects of community, <coughs> other organizations in our communities to really come together on, um, on this mission? Like, why is it important to be fully awake and prepared and engaged in school in a substance-free facility to really perpetuate that and promote that place? So you can see those things. Um, the other thing that we did that's also in the guidebook, if you look down below membership, it talks about readiness. There's a, a brief readiness rubric, and this wasn't done 
in a, a deep study, but rather with a good representation of people who know the school, know the community, know different aspects of it, looked at this readiness rubric and the readiness of how did the community see readiness to really take on a community-based prevention approach. And so you can see we scaled it from what was part of kind of like vague awareness, which is kind of like, yeah, there's something going on here that ought to be addressed, to what was rated as a five, which is really we're kind of prepared to take action. And what you can see here, one of the reasons we said prepared to take action seems to be there, is that it is in the strategic plan. It is something that's part of the board agenda. So we have, I believe, two or three meetings, updates to schedule throughout the school year and the work plan. But again, just to get a sense of where do we think our community is at? So kind of there's some awareness there, some leaders ready to take action, but how do we kind of move into those places? Community action box is just, a, a, again, an example of some things that are taken from that book. Um, our next steps at our next meetings, um, from the Mount of Scutney Hospital, really, from the community-based prevention, they've developed some policy um, best practices rubrics to look over. Um, Hannah Leland, Dean of Students, myself, and two representatives from Mount of Scutney went through some of our policies this summer to do this readiness. We're going to look at those as a group, and if there are any recommendations to the policy committee, we would put those forward. Again, how are our policies really promoting this at this place? So, again, give me an update here. First, come together as a group. Let's kind of ground ourselves in what's seen as some evidence practices, and kind of study those, and then take it into those policies. Is there anything else that you wanted to add? Yeah, yeah. I think a couple of things. One, I think that it's important to understand sort of our community context um, around us. So. Um, our community, meaning our collective, our district and our collective towns, has a lot of strengths, right? We're committed to healthy foods, exercise, outdoor pursuits, students feel connected to each other and feel they have adults that they can turn to. But one of the challenges that our community has, and I just want to make it clear that it's not the school, but it's the community at large, is a permissive attitude toward a lot of substances, in particular marijuana and alcohol. Um, so. I just want to make it clear that that's not the school's fault, um, that that is a reflection of the community at large. And one of the things that really resonated with me in one of our meetings with Melanie Sheehan, who does the Otakuchi Community Prevention Partnership, I think it's called, she, she mentioned that, this, that our community, our district as a whole, is, is one of the harder districts to engage in this conversation. Um, and again, that does the, not the school, but the, the community. Yes, please. Mary Beth and I went to a town meeting. Um, it, it was the educational planning, um, the educational planning committee. Oh, yeah. The town plan. The yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, in, in, town in Woodstock. Yeah. In yeah. Woodstock. Right. Okay. Yeah. And one of the questions from several people was drug use and alcohol use, and they were very apt to blame the school yeah, and the not educators. The fault. And yeah. And it was very interesting because I got very defensive. One as a parent, mm -hmm. you know, because. I'm very cognizant of it, mm -hmm. um, but two, as for the educators in our school mm -hmm. to be blamed for this yeah. problem, and I went home, and in 2020 hindsight, I wish I had said, right. it's a community issue, um, it's, it's not Right. It's, it's not, not just a school, school. And, and, right. a, and, and it bothered me that I didn't have yeah. this kind of information because then you were there as well. Yeah. And, they and just were to give very, a flavor, like some of the yeah. questions on that, um, it was survey reports from students, and one of them was, um, have you used uh, drugs or alcohol in the last uh, year? Right? Yeah. And like you see that for 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th grade, have you ever used drugs or alcohol? Well, it gets higher as you go through the grades. Uh, another one was, have you, you have been under the influence of drugs or alcohol at school in the last year, mm -hmm. right? So those, those are the kinds of questions that were in the survey. Right. But I'm, I'm with you. It was very much a perception of that stuff that it was like a, a cultural issue at the school and not necessarily a community. Yeah, yeah, I think one of the issues that both the police in town face and also, I don't want to speak for you, Garen, but sometimes that can be an issue when the school or the... Um, police officers in town try to enforce the underage use, um, the first thing that the, the parent says is, what grounds did you have to search my child? 
instead of, oh my gosh, my kid's using drugs, what can I do to help? Mm -hmm. So I think it's a, it's a big issue and it's really, really complex. Substance use is incredibly complex. So we think one of the things that we really wanted to focus on with this community group is how do we make sure that kids are not using in school, not coming to school high, not distributing in school, and that's like what we can control, right? right. Um, and so really talking about how to do that on a policy level, how to make sure, I think one of the things that we've talked a lot about is how to make sure that parents um, understand what the policy is and what the consequences are going to be, policies and procedures, if there is a child who's caught with a substance at school so that it's not you know, this finger pointing, what grounds did you have to search my child? It's, this is the policy, this is the procedure, these are the consequences. So what are some ways that we can address that? And then really taking um, the approach of improving protective factors. So in this article, there's um, a really great synopsis of what we know are protective factors for children at every age for preventing use and what are risk factors. So just examples, risk factors are early aggressive behavior. So that's why that piece of the social emotional curriculum is really important in elementary schools because when you have students are just, who are distributing early aggressive behavior, those students are more likely to use substances when they get to high school. So how do you target that behavior before they're at risk for substance use? So that was really interesting to me, so I wanted to point that out. Um, lack of parental supervision, these are other risk factors. Substance abuse um, by peers, uh, drug availability, and then poverty, those are risk factors. And then protective factors are impulse control at a young age, right? So she, uh, this, particular, this particular position has also been working with the nurses. We have a Medicaid coordinator, we have 504 coordinators, um, we have a um, student assistance counselor, and um, if we were to bring in um, somebody to work on policies related to student safety or that type of thing, this, that's where that particular person would land. Um, under uh, the, the, tech, the technology position, we would recommend um, changing that to Director of Technology and Innovation um, and to put um, things, some of our more innovative types of programs such as the New View Studio, STEM, Computer Science, really looking at a K-12 continuum of those programs and um, have the director who is Rap Adamak, um, who has a really strong skill set, not only in IT, but really a, as an educational leader. Um, so putting that for that role. Um, the new director position that you see here is addressing the question of curriculum instruction and assessment. Um, we, we had some conversations around this last year. We are probably one of the last, if not the last district to get a formal K-12 curriculum instruction assistant um, assessment position in the district. Um, so this position would, the elementary instructional coaches would fall into this position, the middle school, high school literacy coach would fall into this position, the math coach and depart their, the department chairs work at the middle school, high school would all report to this individual who would really be looking at K through 12, how, how is our curriculum aligned, um, what are our instructional practices, what professional development do we need. Um, so that is a, a new position. Um, the, the, the recommendation would be most likely to morph the current middle school, high school position into this one and have it cover the K-12. Um, and then finally, Director of Finance and Operations, um, as it has been in the past, continuing to cover HR, accounting, grants, management, um, accounts payroll, payroll, director of buildings and grounds, director of food service, and um, the transportation coordination, particularly as it relates to contracts and that type of thing. So this is the, the plan we're putting forth for your, for your feedback. Um, and then what, given the outcome of this conversation, it would help build um, um, any financial implications for the next budget season. Happy to answer any questions you might have. I think it's, it's a little difficult to have the conversation without the, it's a chicken or egg um, situation without having the financial piece. It's a little bit hard to yeah, here, here's evaluate. Some, yeah, and it, it definitely has, you know, it definitely has some financial implications, I wouldn't say 
it has financial implications. The, the challenge that we ran into in conversation that we had is that last year when we tried to do the budget without having an agreement on what the org chart was, the budget conversation kind of got morphed into the org chart, and that's a big piece to try to do all at once. Mm -hmm. So the idea was if we came up with an org chart that people felt comfortable with, we'll build the budget with that implication. Now that doesn't mean that you can't take things out or put things in, but and, to just to do an initial yeah. pass. And I think this is very, I mean, we needed, we should, we haven't had this and we should have had this all along, but it really goes, you know, I, I sound like a broken record because I always, you know, my thing is like, you don't, you don't make jobs for people, you have jobs and you put people in these jobs. I feel like I say that at least in finance meetings all the time. So this is like exactly what I wanted. I wanted to, and we've, this is, and this is like, you know, the third version of it to get to here. Um, and we'll, now we're going to start to really meet as finance next week to talk about what the money looks like behind this, but this will all be presented to you, you know, in the next month or two. Um, but we really... But also, yeah, yep. this org chart re reflects what we asked for last year. And a lot of the positions in the blue are not in the blue boxes. Yeah, mine's okay. white. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, in my blue boxes <laughs> are not add-on positions. They're not new things. They're it's existing positions. So it's really just... Um, so the, only, the only new is the director of curriculum instruction. Well, but we <laughs> had Jen at the high school. I mean, that was not. That was just middle school or she just was high seven school. Through, she's been seven through twelve. Yeah. So it's expanding her role. And, and if you remember last year, we talked about adding a, an elementary school only person to do that work. Yes. Um, yeah. and what was it? What's also? Do we budget last year for an after school director district wide? No, that was a conversation that came up. That that was not something that was the in the budget. Um, the conversation that was held, uh, uh, according to my recollection, was that this is a lot to put on all principals, right? We're trying to keep principals working with kids, working with teachers, um, but that we, we would need to figure out a way to identify some kind of after-school director for next year. So looking at, you know, so if you look, for example, the West principal has about 250, 280 students um, in a building and about, I don't know, like 35 professional staff, as opposed to a Reading that has about 30, the students in the 30s and 20 professional staff primarily. Um, so how do you kind of even out those positions? And so that would be a position that would have a little bit more room in its work. So could this person take on um, becoming the pre-K director and just coordinating it across the district? Same thing with after school director. So it doesn't add an additional person, um, additional benefits, all that kind of thing. Um, and um, a lot of that work could be done from Reading. So it keeps somebody in the building um, more of the time. Um, so that was the thinking behind that. So that's all one position. That's all one position. <laughs> I think it's a great start. I think it really has to be flushed out. It's not going to be here. I mean, putting positions, na putting names down is just positions. Um, you say that it's what we asked for last year. There's a lot of people here that may have only got it voted in in March, so they were not part of the process of last year. I think it goes, yeah, into, I, yeah. I think it goes into finance because yeah. it's the start I've been here a long budget. time and I just need to know, I mean, there's a lot of, there might be personnel questions in here that I'm not ready to ask at this point. Yep. Yeah. That's all. It looks like I took a lot of work, so thank you. Yeah. Next Wednesday. Yeah, next 8 Wednesday. 8.30. <laughs> 8.30. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 8.30 or 8. Um, Mike, he's got a job to drop his kids off at school. He can't get here till 8.30. 8.30. We're going to do 8.30. You need to go for coffee. Yeah. Maybe coffee half hour. Coffee, coffee's ready. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the donuts, right? Oh, yeah. 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 Donuts. Wait, wait, wait. We make it 8.30? I'll be there. 8.30, but we need their 8 to eat them. <laughs> 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 I might be going to that <laughs> Mike? Mike, do you want to talk about the oh, declaration right of official intent? Sure. I'm assuming it's attached to the package. Did you get it there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to kind of combine efforts with 
with the presentation that Ben made tonight, um, with, with obviously the, the building and the bond offering. You know, essentially, Paul Giuliani gave us um, these two documents. One is the the draft resolution. Well, the first was the declaration. Let's start with the declaration document. This thing sets up our ability or our intent to aggregate any preliminary spend that we do up front. Um, consultants and architects, for as an example, on this project, and then roll it into the eventual bond. If we end up moving forward on the the ultimate project itself, which is the Woodstock High School, Middle School High School. It does not commit us to spend one dollar, but essentially reserve the right to do so. Um, and keep the right to aggregate it, keep track of it uh, for bond recapture purposes. So if we choose, obviously, to do the project, we can bring these preliminary spend funds into it. Um, the second doc is the resolution. Um, and that is similar for basically just stating our intent to move forward on this project state the obvious that we can't cover $68 million as part of our normal operating budget um, and we would um, you know, need to use a debt instrument, i.e. the bond, uh, to finance that project. Again, even the resolution document doesn't commit us to spend anything. It's just the right to reserve uh, it for that purpose. And so when we get closer to this, we can activate this, right? Um, and use these documents for our advantage. Just, just hoping to, um, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, I guess the benefit to this, I've, I've been thinking a lot about Prosper Valley, right? We're talking about that. <clears throat> if we adopt a resolution like this, um, you have the ability to go back like 60 days, right? Correct. And aggregate that towards the, the bond in the future. So what that would mean is some of this money <coughs> well, we're agreeing to, to spend, if, if we did go forward, and get this bond because we have the elementary schools as part of that package, you could then recoup it. And that could go back into education, different things go back into reserve funds. So you're getting your recouping that from that bond. Yep. Um, I would get back 60 and forward three years. Yes? I, I don't know. I don't understand where the voters fit into this. Because no. they don't. They don't. They don't. This, is, this would be a board vote, correct, Mike? Correct. Do you mean, Pamela, if you borrow money against a bond and then the taxpayers vote down the bond? Yeah. You know I mean? Thank you. We're still spending the money out of the current budget. So all it's saying is we're still, like tonight, if we say we want to spend that $100,000, that's happening. We decided that. Sure. If we keep spending additional money, that's still coming out of our current budget. It's just if the bond gets approved, then we get to kind of recoup it out of the bond. We get to say, OK, we spent $130,000 on Prosser Valley. So when we get the bond approval and you get that lump sum of money, you can okay, put it in the I'm sorry. Uh, uh, bear with me. I'm sick or, so, or I'm tired or something. It's late. It, it's late. <laughs> um, if we. If we want to borrow $68 million, obviously we don't have that money, so it's dependent on the voters. So I don't understand the order of things. What is the we wouldn't back? be able to pay it back. What is the look back? 30 days, did you say? 60, 60 days. 60 days. 60 and days. three years so forward. Really so if, if, so if the voters years. decided not to, to approve this, Thank you. we okay. just we would we'll all use money, which we're spending anyway. That's it's right. just that we can't. Okay. It would just come out of the normal annual budget. Yeah. That's all. Yeah, so that's all this is. It sounds like we still have to have the kind of conversation that we had tonight, like what's the impact, right, to the current operations, but then if you want to recouping it, then those impacts are mitigated or negated. If you put this forward, right, and then come March we have a vote for the full bond, and if the taxpayers say yes, okay, let's say we spent money in March prior to to do more work over at Comfort, Killington, Barnard. I'm going to use everybody, okay? And we had it on our budget, then we would be able to float back 60 days to do it. That's all that's going to do. Okay. But it still has to, we would be voting on, the, the taxpayer will be voting on any of the stuff that we used to spend. We just approved, we did a $100,000 to Comfort, but that was just working into the current budget. Okay. So nobody's voting anything in that's not approved the voters. Can I just check, Mike, is this something that you want the board to be aware of now, or did you want them to vote on either portion of it? I think it needs to be acted on before we spend any money. So maybe Prosper is the wrong example, because we want to get that started, because we know winter's coming. <laughs> it is winter. Right. <laughs> did it so, come yet? So no, it's getting colder, isn't it? It's getting no, it's colder. Not. Actually, it's been kind of nice. Let's keep that nice weather. But.
So the point is, you know, maybe that's a bad example because we have to get started and the look back period's not going to apply. But any other projects that we're going to spend money on uh, out of the normal operating budget, um, that's what this is intent is for. So, um, like, I would definitely recommend we, we activate this before we hire, you know, another architect or Lee's second stage of whatever, you know, we want to do to explore the, the new high school, middle school. That th that's all I'm trying to say here. Yeah, but if, if the look back is only 60 yeah. days, you only want to vote this thing 60 days, you know, whatever. You don't want to vote it in tonight. Nope, I, didn't, I wasn't recommending yeah. I think that was the question for Mary Beth. This is something we should be acting on now. Yeah. And the answer no. is no. No. You want to wait. Otherwise, but it's helpful to know it exists, so thank you. Yeah. And we can talk about this more in detail at the retreat, too, and, and the implications of it. I think talking about it at 9 o'clock at night <laughs> is hard because we've digested a lot of information. Can I just ask one question? I'm like, so is this, a, is this a standard document? Is this something our council prepared for us? How, where did we get this? Yep, so Paul Julian, uh, who is um, our legal counsel, yep, for Stitzel Page. Six, no, I mean, um, 60 it, days uh, is the maximum look right. back you can have on something like this? What, what's the max? I'm sorry. Is 60 days the maximum number of days? I mean, to look back. To look back? Once you, act, once you vote and we activate it, then a 60 day look back and a three year carry forward. Well, I know forward. it's been drafted and it says 60 days. I mean, because we're all saying standard. this prosper value money, we're standard. not going to be. Yeah, that correct. standard that's, that's is 60 correct. days. Correct. Sorry, were you saying 60 days from the date that we activate this or 60 change. days from the, a bond vote? No, okay. when we activate this. Okay. So we want to, to Jim's point, argument. Right. we probably want to do this like in January, which is yeah. 60 days prior to the bond vote in March. So I mean, we, we voted in March. Right. Gotcha. Okay. It changes my argument. Gives you a longer window. Right. But you still don't yeah, that's why. I, 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 so I'm sorry if I didn't answer it correctly. I was saying, no, we don't have to take any action tonight or in the next meeting, but before we appropriate large amounts of money towards the research and development of, of exploring the middle school, high school. Mm -hmm. Motion to adjourn. Second. So moved. So moved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.